We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. And this is the first episode we're recording in 2021, because last time, you know... But the release schedule came out on Friday, January the 1st. So happy new year, everybody. Uh, we're still into this brand new year. Hoping things turn out better than 2020, but don't want to jinx it because if you ever say, well, it couldn't possibly be worse. I mean, that's... that's. I've already said that so many times. That's I'm the sorry. worst thing you can say in any movie. <laughs> we all know that. <laughs> yeah. I'll, and I'll be right back. Right. So, those are the, Or those you'll things. always yes. be here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's some foreshadowing. <laughs> yeah. Surely it won't rain. That's right. Uh, yeah, so this is uh, the new year, mm-hmm. 2021. Here we are, all together. We made it, most of us, some of us. So uh, let's soldier on and uh, look forward to a better year. We still don't know what's going to happen with uh, the AKM fire and all that other yeah. stuff. So we're already seeing lots of delays out there. Yeah, some fallout uh, from that for sure. CES is going to be that, strange this year, obviously. Um, all yeah. all virtual. I keep getting notifications yeah. that it's virtual and ready to go, and I should go visit it. I'm like, <laughs> I have a feeling that somehow you're going to got you're going to get it so that I can smell CES through mm. my speakers, and I just I just don't want that. <laughs> I just don't want that. And you know, guys, if you've ever wondered why girls would rather hang out as a group together instead of with a group of guys go to see yes fair enough that will let you know (laughs) that why why females prefer their own company to us because we're disgusting (laughs) and we smell bad and you know we've got no problems just letting one rip whenever we want right in the middle of a big old crowd and uh nice. you could see it at ces you could see like there would be like these dead zones where somebody would walk in mm. and then go straight to the sides because somebody had let one go and <laughs> we were all having to walk through it as we were going through it's awful well it's awful, so. that won't happen in the virtual ces this year so there you go that's one upside uh people have been sending in uh quite a few you know of the early pre CES stories yeah. and that and and by and large I, I just to explain why you might not be hearing it and say hey why why isn't Rob talking about this on the show and why isn't Tom mentioning it in the news when I sent it in we're not going to bother with the rumor stuff i mean obviously yeah. at this point a lot of it is just like yeah we know that's what it's going to be but at this point it's still just rumor and like things do change things get pulled off the schedule definitely things become vaporware and we've done it in the right. past and talked about stuff and it's like yeah but it just never showed up so we're not gonna bo- until something is real we're not gonna bother talking about it uh unless it's right. you know like very clearly confirmed official press release then fine we'll comment on that so there you go jo- that's just an explanation plus we're doing this on tuesday and we're releasing the right. episode on friday yeah. so there's you know four days of news to happen between now and then <laughs> when you're actually hearing this so yes it's it's we're we're, in, we're talking to you from the past mm-hmm. it's okay don't worry about it we'll catch up we'll get there <laughs> All right, this is AV Rent, the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions. To get your questions answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. Go to avrant.com. Leave us a comment there, facebook.com slash avrantpodcast, youtube.com slash avrant. Contact Rob directly at rob at avrant.com. His Twitter is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. My Twitter is at avrant underscore Tom. Before we get started here, let's thank our listeners of the week. Mm -hmm. To become a listener of the week, you have to support the podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to patreon.com slash avrantpodcast and signing up to be a subscribing member, a continuing supporter, an AV (laughs) backer. I don't know. (laughs) Didn't get any good. I'm looking for something like that. I didn't didn't really go anywhere with that. I was trying. I was looking for athletic supporter, but for AV, but I didn't quite get to the Uh level of entendre. So anyways, we have 126 patrons over at patreon.com, including James W., who is a member of our Two Hour Plus Club. And Patreon, every month, uh, they will take some money from you and give it to us, a minimum of of $1. So the cost to sign up there, we get, I think, 70-something cents of that, I think. Something more. I there. wouldn't know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 126 patrons over at patreon.com. So, 
Thank you to our patrons. Very nice. Yes, thank you. Uh, that's patreon.com slash podcast, as Tom said. 126 patrons over there. Thank you very much for the support. James W., thank you so much for being one of them. Uh, and yes, we do have PayPal as well. Didn't have any uh, PayPal donations to mention this week, but for anyone who would like to do a one-time donation, if you come to avrant.com, our website, over on the right-hand side, it says support AV Rant, and that will take you to PayPal. You don't need a PayPal account. You can just use a credit card if you don't want to sign up. All right, so we have Chris and David. They have uh, supported the podcast in a different way. If you can't support us financially, we understand. Just find some way to support us and let us know what you did or if we just know what you did because mm-hmm. you did it this way, then uh, we'll mention you unless you send it directly to me, in which case I'll forget to put you on the list. And I'll have to Not do forget, it again it's next just, week, you know, so. amongst your 199 emails for the day. So Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so uh, Chris and David sent some photos to me uh, via, I think, question at avrant.com. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I had at least one other person. I, I wanted. Who's the electrician guy? Uh, the, the Mario. No, that wasn't him. I think it was a James. <laughs> I think it was a James. I thought it was the electrician guy, but I think a James sent me a, a couple of documents that uh, that I ended up uh, you know keeping in the background, sort of to to use as impetus for more uh, articles mm-hmm. to write and stuff like that. But Chris and David sent photos to me to with permission to use that that information on avgadgets.com, which I'm the editor in chief of. Also had uh, it, it, and if you know, I, I can't guarantee I'll use your photos, but what I do is I just resize them and sometimes crop them. Uh, and then throw them into the back end of AV Gadgets, and then I, I name them with your name, and then the uh, you know what I will be searching for when I am looking for yeah. a photo that looks like yours. So they'll say screen or seats or you know something like that, or front of room, back of room, that sort of thing, you know, projector. And uh, you know, so if you send me some photos of your gear, uh, you may be and, and permission for me to use it ad infinitum or whatever however in you say that perpetuity Latin. that's it so I, I will throw them back there and use your because i'd rather use like real photos yeah. than the stock stuff that they send out so this just makes it easier so you know i've got you know there's plenty of pictures of the rooms and stuff like that and i'll i'd love to have more so that's fine but if you have a piece of gear or you, you're really proud of your wiring in the back of your receiver take a picture of that you know i can uh or you get a new piece of gear, just take a picture of it from all sorts of different angles and send it to me. That's fine, too. That sort of thing, uh, I might just use the back of it or some some uh, portion of the back of it as an example of, you know, speaker or, or HDMI inputs or something that's labeled ARC or something along those lines. So it's always those little weird pictures that I'm always having a hard time finding. Yeah, the insets. So. So Chris and David sent me photos, so thank you very much, as well as I'm pretty sure it was a James, and I think there's one other, so I'll have to go back and look to make sure that we give that person credit, but uh, I think the other two people that sent me stuff, one of them I'm pretty sure we already credited, and the other one, he's probably seeing his pictures up on the website right now, <laughs> so Victor, that's what it was, Okay, Victor, and I- I'll put the I name in there. It. Whatever, I don't remember. <laughs> All right, David also gave us a shout out to Outlaw Audio. Uh, he he bought their uh, OAW4 wireless kit on our advice, and it's work, working perfectly so far. It was very interesting to see his AV receiver report how much farther away it thinks his subwoofers are due to the bit of latency in the wireless transmission, which is a very interesting thing that, that people often get freaked out by. They <laughs> they, they know the, the subwoofer is like seven feet away, and then they, pl- they, they put them in this wireless... Uh, you know, uh, transmission system to get the the subwoofer signal to the back of the room or wherever there, and all of a sudden the subwoofer is like twenty five feet away. That's right. And uh, all that it's doing is you know correcting for the fact that there is a bit of latency as it transforms and then sends it wirelessly and then retransforms it into an analog signal so they can uh, so they can it can use it. So that's uh, that's it, it. It's working perfectly. It's the way it's supposed to work. You know, it's just correcting for that latency, but it's very very neat. Mm-hmm. Uh, Corey bought a Marantz SR6014 receiver from Accessories for Less and let them know uh, it was because we recommended him. So thank you. I'm going to go back up th- through these guys. So we've got uh, Chris, David, and Victor, for sure, uh, who sent me photos. David, who talked us up to Outlaw, and Corey, who talked us up to Accessories for Less. So thank you to all of you. Indeed. I'll just repeat those names. Chris, David, Victor, thanks for the photos. David, thanks for the shout out to Outlaw Audio. Congrats on your purchase, and I hope that continues to work perfectly for you. And Corey, thanks for talking us up to Accessories for Less. 
<laughs> just as Tom takes a sip. No, it's okay. That's okay. <laughs> so we uh, we also got some notes of gratitude for uh, keeping the podcast going mm-hmm. during uh, where our soon, hopefully soon to be ending trying times of COVID. So uh, thank you to Mike Lee, Nathan, Joseph, and David for sending those notes in. Yes, uh, very much appreciated to get those notes of gratitude and encouragement to keep the podcast going. Uh, Mike, Lee, Nathan, Joseph, and David. And as I always say, if I missed anybody who, who also sent something on Twitter or Facebook, book or whatnot uh by no means am i intending to leave anybody out i'm just going by the emails and even that i might be overlooking so uh yes thank you to everybody who continues to listen continues to write to us it's wonderful to have this community keep on going and uh yeah here, here's to another full year we're gonna keep trucking along all right uh we have to talk about when we're gonna switch back to uh go out and listen to something. when it's we're, actually we're the, safe to do so it's not we're know, not there I'm, yet I, I know we're not there yet i know i understand that but i'm starting to like know people who have gotten the vaccine uh-huh. and i'm like oh okay feels like light at the end of the tunnel here right. I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little i hopeful. mean they've only had the first dose there's no chance they've had the second dose of it yet and it's very yeah, important to, to have the second dose with those mrna vaccines because mm-hmm. otherwise you're body could potentially learn that it's not a threat if you don't have the booster that reminds it right. yes i am a threat so uh yeah we're we're not out of the woods yet uh it'll be a momentous no. occasion when we get to sign off the way that we're, we're meant gonna, to sign off you will know it'll be the name of the That's podcast right. that year <laughs> that day not year hopefully all right in the news roku might buy quibi's content to put on their roku channel it's just going to be one big long movie <laughs> very disjointed <laughs> It's just going to be four and a half hours of Quibi, the motion picture. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, people were wondering what, what will become of Quibi's content. No idea what the uh, financials of this deal would be. Though obviously, no. Quibi is looking to recover whatever they whatever they can to try and make their investors not quite so mad at them. But uh, Roku, yes, they have their own Roku channel. Um, they basically licensed content from everywhere else for the most part. But... Uh, this would be one way they could have some exclusive content that you can only find on the Roku channel. No idea how you handle what was sort of the whole conceit of Quibi, which is that everything is shot twice, once in landscape, once in portrait, and you can switch on the fly between portrait and landscape. That was the idea of Quibi, was that you're always going to watch it on a mobile device, and you can switch between the two perspectives at any given time. I don't see how that's going to work on Roku. I guess they're just going to show you the landscape Landscape. version at all times, but... I don't know, maybe there'll be a button. You push a button on the remote and it switches you to portrait and you get some lovely gigantic black bars on the left and right of your screen. Is there any content on there that I care about, Rob? Is it, would it be like I say, I the about? only one I ever heard about was the golden arm. And then there was some other one where somebody's, you know, companion doll like started talking to him or something. I don't know. That was like the only two shows That's... I ever heard of. All right. <laughs> You know, when just, that deal for twenty three ninety five finally goes through, right. <laughs> you know, we'll all be very excited. I'm not surprised. I mean, everybody is, at this point, we'll take whatever, not we, but con- these different streaming services are just looking for different content. No Apparently. Matter, you know, whatever it is. So, you know, whatever. Hey, you want to stream AV Rant? Come, come at me with a licensing deal <laughs> on Netflix. Right. Maybe you guys get the lip sync to sync up and then we can we could really talk. <laughs> All right, this comes from our listener, Daz. Power Sound Audio is introducing their first subwoofer model that uses 12-inch drivers. The I mean, because 12-inch drivers is just too small for anything that they They've make. only had 15 and up. So the 2410, S2410, is a sealed, which is this, dual opposed, I guess that's what 24 is, to a 12-inch design for $975, making it their least expensive offering. Pre-orders up with first shipments expected in February. That's right. Um, how, how good are they about hitting those targets, Rob? Uh, I mean, power sound, by and large, uh, and not not necessarily right down to the month or down to the week or so. You know, sometimes there's delays as expected, but they've been pretty good about if they okay. if they actually list something as being available and here's when it's going to ship, they, they haven't been wildly off the mark on any of that. Because usually they don't put it up until the parts have actually arrived and they're starting assembly. Sure. Okay, well, that's good. Yeah. That's good. That's what we want to see. There's too many companies... AV one two three that uh, would talk and take pre orders right. for uh, stuff that may or may not ever exist. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, 
Right. SVS. SVS is offering a $400 upgrade kit to replace the amplifier in the 13 Ultra Series subwoofer models with the current 4000 Series amp. This will add the ability to use SVS smartphone amp while increasing power and DSP control. Adding adding DSP or increasing the power of the DSP? Uh, it's, it's Yeah, it's a, a more powerful DSP engine okay. that's in the new one because the uh, 13 Ultra Series already had DSP control in, in those okay. sledge amps. That's but, what I thought. Uh, yeah, this is the newer version, the current version. So you'll, you'll have to remember that you will need to use the smartphone amp for all your subwoofer controls, though, even volume, since the 13 Ultra Series does not have a control panel, and this upgrade kit does not add one, which makes sense. They just slam the other amp in there. Uh, but honestly, how many times do you actually need to control your subwoofer? Well, like, some people like to change once. the volume on their sub you know, fairly frequently. So you will need to bust you do that from the receiver side. Come on. Now. Yeah, that's true. But, uh, but if, whatever <laughs> you want to change, uh, if you do this upgrade, uh, to your 13 ultra series, and I'm not sure how many 13 ultra series owners were out there, but, uh, I am amongst them and, uh, yes, have been in contact via Twitter and email ah. to say, Hey, uh, I really don't need to upgrade my 13 ultra series, uh, cylinder subs in my teeny tiny little apartment room, but it could <laughs> the make ones for I fun, can reach out and touch. Could make for fun uh, podcast content, and uh, yeah, uh, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Right. Know what I mean? Know what I mean? And uh, they 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 seem uh, they seem keen on the idea. So hopefully, fingers crossed, that all works out, and uh, I might be able to report <laughs> on that at some point in the future. <laughs> So now we know exactly what your volume number is because right. you'll be able to see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You can show it on the app. <laughs> and everyone can marvel at how you could put so little power right. into anything, Rob. You can run it on a car battery, uh, not a car battery, on a double A AA battery. <laughs> All right, in the comments uh, from one of our listeners, Corinder, just wanted to share some updates. Uh, he's added a bunch more uh, DIY absorption panels in his and his black velvet to cover the front of his theater is on the way. So, so he also picked up the High Shock 3D emitter to use with his JVC projector. It doesn't work with the 3D glasses that went with his Sony projector, but it does work with the 3D glasses that went th with the Sony TV from upstairs. So different, whatever. <laughs> it looks great on his 120-inch screen, and he found someone online who was selling their Sony 3D glasses, basically never used, four pairs for $20. Yeah. <laughs> Not $200. But twenty dollars—that's a pretty good deal. That, that's that's someone who back in the day bought a three D TV and never used the three D part of it, and I was like, "Well, these aren't worth." That's anything. all of them. That's almost all of them, Rob. Come on. That's right. So that that sounds like a good idea. Search the used market for three D glasses. I bet there are a pile of them out there. If if the people can even find where they stored them in their garage or attic or in a closet somewhere, because I think that's where a lot of three D glasses live today. All right, let's get some questions in here. Andrew, this is Andrew's our model sh spaceship guy. Andrew wants to make acoustic panels. Okay, well, you need to get with uh, Grinder here. Apparently, he's <laughs> an expert at it. Uh, he was going to use Roxel, but then he also noticed their comfort board insulation, which is the very rigid insulation that you would typically typically secure directly to a basement foundation. He was thinking that the more rigid insulation might be easier to work with, and maybe he wouldn't even need a frame. What do we say? I took a look at this stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't, I mean, it looks almost identical to the stuff I've worked with in the past, but I, I can't touch it to see how right. rigid the stuff is. So if it's too rigid, if it's too, you know, if it's, if it's too thick, uh, too dense, it's not going to let the high frequencies through, which means it's just going to act as a reflector like your wall, but you know, it still should work for base. Yeah. Um, this stuff is uh, rated, I think, at what, like R80 or something like that? Yeah, it's, it's so, high uh, insulation value. I think he was, I mean, I can actually say the end of the story because he, he ended up he ended up getting the comfort board mainly because of price because for whatever reason he okay. found a, a stock of it that was like 75% off. So yeah, at that price, by all means, go for it. Uh, if it's mostly for bass trapping, it should work okay. I think he was kind of looking at the STC number, the sound transmission class number, and right. saying, hey, that compared to the regular rock wool, rock soul insulation the stc number was the same that's not really the absorption factor uh the stc number is a blockage of sound from one side of the uh, to the other um so right. i'm not necessarily going to say that the comfort board it would be my first choice it is 
It is very rigid. It is like you can yeah. you can indent it if you push your finger into it. You can indent it, um, so it's not you know that hard that it can't uh, be like pushed in. But if you indent it, it stays indented. Whereas the rock wool, you know, has resiliency to it. You push it in and it bounces back out, uh, like mm. insulation would. So yeah, like Tom says, uh, that's probably not going to be the best for uh, absorbing very high frequencies. Something that is that stiff is going to act more as a reflector at the high frequency. But if you're mostly worrying about base trapping, should be fine for that. So you mentioned how it can be beneficial to have an air gap behind the panel, but what about an air gap in between two pieces of insulation, like an air sandwich with insulated insulation bread? <laughs> uh, so if you think of it this way, what we're what we're trying to do is reduce the energy of the the sound waves. Mm -hmm. And one way that you reduce energy of any uh, any wave is like this is to have it have to go through multiple mediums. Mm -hmm. So with the air gap behind, what what was happening is it was just passing through the insulation, and then you know so it's going from air into the solid, quote unquote, of the insulation, and then back into the air behind, bouncing off the wall, then going through the air again into the insulation again, and then back into the air of the room. You know, so it's changed you know into in and out of the the insulation twice, uh, and back in and out of air three times. So this is uh, this is one of the ways that we we can reduce the the en energy, you know. Plus, the as it goes through the insulation, it's uh, losing a lot of its energy to heat. Mm -hmm. You know, as it vibrates the fibers in there, that energy is being lost to heat. Uh, so, with the, you know, would this work? I I mean, I think it would. I don't know how effective it would be because I don't know how big of a gap you could have. Right. You kind of want to have, uh, you know, so the the rule of thumb is you if you have two inches of insulation. Uh, you can have, uh, and you have the two inch air gap behind it, you get this, you know, very similar uh, effect as having four inches of insulation, mm -hmm. like directly on the wall, uh, with no air gap whatsoever. But of course, two inches of insulation is cheaper right. <laughs> and easier to work with <laughs> than, than, than four inches of insulation. Now, if you took that four inches of insulation, you pulled it four inches off the wall, mm -hmm. well, then you get, you know, eight. Uh, I mean, kind of rule of thumb. So, how much of a gap are you going to have here? Are you going to have a one inch in the front, a one inch in the back, and then a one inch gap in between? I mean, I think you'd just be probably better off just sandwiching them together. But yeah, there's it might be it might end up it might end up being six of one half dozen of the other. There's a bit of an additional factor too, which is that um, any time that uh, sound waves meet a new medium, the border between two mediums, say the insulation medium and the air medium, uh, that there is, there's a reflection that happens off of that. And it's weird because you think, okay, if a sound wave is traveling through essentially a solid or through a liquid and it comes to the air, then it's actually going to like reflect off the air and come back into the solid. Yeah, it does. That's how waves work. Yeah. It's kind of bizarre. Um, <laughs> Mythbusters covered that really well about a wave that's created underwater and then it meets the transition from water to air. And most of that energy gets reflected back down into the water. Um, so one of the issues is that if you have a very small air gap between uh, two pieces of insulation, let's say it's like a one inch or a half inch air gap in there, then that little bit of air is actually going to have like some resonance to it. As odd as that sounds, mm. there's going to be like a bit of a resonance just to that tiny little gap. And when you have a resonance in a very small gap like that, that can create some odd acoustic anomalies that you don't really want in general the the safer advice is to avoid triple leafs uh triple leafs is is having these two sort of solid or semi-solid layers with a small air gap in between them avoiding triple leafs is generally the advice that's given from places like soundproofing.com and that so um given that this is more complex to build to do this yeah. uh, i i would just go ahead and have the insulation and then have an air gap behind it i wouldn't try to put an air gap in between because now you've created a, a weird little triple leaf there Mm, okay. So GIG has their impression series panels with decorative wood patterns on the face uh, of the absorption panels. They say it adds some diffusion and the wooden plates only seem to be about a quarter inch thick. He found some decorative screen panels at a, a Home Depot, plastic and a th uh, 0.3 inches <laughs> thick. Yeah third of an inch thick he honestly wants them for looks more than anything but could they actually help acoustically or maybe uh they would they cover too much of the absorption panel and would hurt the acoustics what do we think i mean i would worry more about the plastic vibrating and mm. uh making noise than i would anything else but if you secured it down well mm -hmm. somehow 
I don't see any problem with this. I, I, I think that the base is going to go right through. Yep. It's not going to care anything about that. Uh, and the it, it would reflect more of the high frequencies, but then again, you're using that comfort use board this, that we suspect the comfort is board. Do it. <laughs> it's probably doing it anyways. So I think you're fine. I mean, I think I'd, I think I'd be okay with using this. Yeah, uh, showing an image of it on YouTube for anyone who wants to see exactly what we're looking at. It, it does look like, uh, especially because we're thinking that you're probably going to be reflecting high frequencies off of the material you're using anyway. I do think this would be fine to use if it's mostly about looks. Got no problem with that. Um, I will say, Geek, for their part with their impression series, they've admitted themselves that, yeah, like the diffusion that it, that it does is is minimal <laughs> it's minimal, it's right. really not an actual diffusion panel it's not even a scatter plate um that it's, it's right, mostly right. about looks in their case too so yeah not much of a difference here as long as it's not going to rattle and create sounds that way i've got no problem with these decorative panels on top so if he was using the regular rock wall uh would you still have that same recommendation if you were, he was if he had a regular panel would you still be okay with him putting it on top uh i think so because i mean the absorption panels so are too. are much less about high frequencies if, if you want to treat high frequencies you're going to do proper diffusion so if you were thinking that this is going to be proper diffusion that i would say no i wouldn't anticipate mm. this being proper diffusion that that really does help uh anything that you're seeing in measurements of high frequencies but it will it harm anything i don't think so yeah, I, I would have the same recommendation. Yeah. I don't. I think for the most part, you know, acoustically, this is not going to do a whole lot, uh, either f pro or con. Right. As long <laughs> as you're securing it down uh, well enough, and that may require that instead of having, like, say, this is a two two foot by four foot panel, which is what mm -hmm. the rock wall normally comes in, it may mean that you have to cut a cut a little section out of the middle and put a, a, a center brace that you can attach mm. this thing to in the center to make sure that you are uh, it's not vibrating at all but that would be the only thing i would worry about is when you hit a, a big bass note mm. you are essentially having a, a membrane here that can vibrate mm. so you will you'd have to i'd be very cautious about that but other than that it'd be okay so Andrew picked up a use a B and K five channel amplifier, the AV five thousand series one. It's five by one hundred and five watts for a very low price. His receiver is a Denon X thirty six hundred H with a five uh, five point one point four speaker configuration. It's your problem right there, bud. You only got a point one. <laughs> uh, he also asked about potentially picking up a two channel Sony, Sony integrated amp to power his Zone two a couple of weeks ago. So do we think he should he should use the B and K to power just his front three speakers in his theater and let his Denon power the surrounds and Atmos speakers? That would leave two channels free on the B and K to power zone two or or can't things be assigned so that the B and K powers five speakers in the theater? Overall, how do you assign what powers what in the Denon Denon's menus? So I I mean Rob's gonna know exactly the answer to this question. <laughs> so I'm gonna answer in general because I don't I'm not looking at a Denon manual right now. Mm. Thank you very much. But uh so it really depends on what the speaker terminals, how they're sort of labeled in the back of your, uh, or how many you have back there. It's very common to not be able, especially with uh, not the higher end receivers, to uh, to just be able to assign any channel to any amp, mm. uh, to any speaker that you want. Uh, there will usually be options. So it might say zone two, surround back, Dolby Atmos or something like that, or Atmos, you know, Atmos, pair two or something along those lines so it, it may give you options along those lines in which case what you describe so what you described in the first case powering the front three mm -hmm. and then having the denon do everything else in the room and then having the b and k do the zone two mm -hmm. i am sure no matter what receiver you choose that will work that will work. <laughs> you know, as long as it's that will work guaranteed yeah. the other option of having it power the three in your room uh, the five in your room and then having the denon power the surround surround no, does he have surround backs? Uh, yeah, uh, no, no, surround, no. But he's got five surrounds and the four overheads, mm -hmm. and then also power the, the zone two. That is less likely to work because I don't think you'll have the right speaker terminals for it. I don't think you'll be able to reassign them, but uh, it is possible. It, I mean, you, what you will have in your if you try to do it that way, uh, what you would have is unused channels in your home theater on your receiver that you couldn't use to power zone two. Uh, 
but the first option will definitely work. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, with with your particular receiver, the X3600H, uh, you're going to look at the amplifier assign. If you look at that in your manual speaker settings, uh, you're going to notice that once you tell it that you have nine or more speakers, that you don't have the option of powering zone two from the receiver itself. And if you want to use 5.1.4 or 7.1.4 in your theater, you have to say that you have a nine or 11 speaker setup. So there's no option to uh, power zone two internally at that point. Right. So you can definitely say, I've got a nine speaker setup. Uh, zone two, the pre-outs will still be active, but you'll need to connect those zone two pre-outs to separate amplification. Uh, but I mean, this this seems perfect to me. Run your front three speakers off the BNK and uh, run your zone two off the remaining two channels of that BNK and have your den and power your surrounds in your four Atmos speakers. It will definitely be able to handle those just fine. So the BNK amp has a 12 volt in and a 12 volt out. Uh, and these are used to power something on and off or trigger you know, mm-hmm. the triggers. That's what they do. Uh, but they are RCA plugs, not the 3.5 millimeter plugs like the 12 volt triggers in, on his Denon. Can he just use a 3.5 millimeter to RCA adapter? Would it somehow be better to use an RCA cable and then uh, an RCA to 3.5 millimeter adapter to plug into his Denon? And will that 12 volt in- input on the BNK amp turn it on and off along with his Denon? That's what it's supposed to do. The in. Yeah, it's what it's supposed it, to be. It is a little bit weird because I looked it up in the manual just to see what the heck was going on. And they, they, they call it a 12-volt trigger mute. They don't call it a 12-volt trigger oh. standby. Uh, so, I mean, what it will what it will definitely do is make the amplifier go silent when you turn your Denon off. That is for sure. Whether it will actually power the BNK amplifier down, I don't know. It seems mm. like maybe not. To they, they use the word mute, but at the same time, if you're just like cutting power to the transformer that's effectively the same thing um because i mean it basically just has a hard power rocker switch otherwise so i don't really know if it's going to be saving you electricity (laughs) it is definitely going to make it fall silent and not produce anything coming out of your speakers at the very least it's going to be a mute which is beneficial for when you're powering on and powering off your denon you know if the amp is already hot yeah then you can get a thump. You, get a, you, you get a thump through yeah. your speakers or you know whatever whatever's attached to it. So yeah, that is beneficial. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would still use this. I, I'm agree with Rob. And it sounds a little. Wonky. It's just the wording they used. Yeah, and it is yeah. a little unusual for the 12 volt trigger to be an RCA plug. Although electrically, there's absolutely no reason why it can't be. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether you have a uh, uh, a mono 3.5 millimeter cable that you already have, and you just connect a 3.5 millimeter to RCA adapter, or if you just use an RCA cable and use an RCA to 3.5 millimeter plug adapter. Either way is fine. That doesn't. All make the a voltage trigger does is is sense whether or not there's voltage coming in that's right whether or not there's an output from the receiver yeah. to the, the the bnk and then the output of the bnk goes to you know another amplifier or something else that you know says oh i'm on you get to be on too <laughs> and yeah. that's that's kind of the way this oh, I mean, so once no, the voltage goes away there's no like then, uh, uh like sound signal information being right, right, sent it's a, right, it's right. an absolute so yeah it doesn't matter i mean i guess the 3.5 millimeter millimeter cable is probably going to be skinnier so that might be one reason to use it but um yeah. if you already have an rca cable on hand and you can just get an rca to 3.5 millimeter plug that'll work just fine too so in the back of the B&K amp, there are level dials for all five channels. What's the proper way to set those? So I've seen this before, and it's actually ex- extremely unusual these days to find amplifiers with individual volume pots for each channel. Uh, it's extremely helpful when you're trying to uh, test speakers. When you've got <laughs> multiple speakers in, it makes things so much easier because you can switch uh, speakers you can level match everything and switch speakers without having to worry about, you know, like you're going A, B or whatever, without having to worry about re-level matching in between your mm. A and B. So it's extremely helpful. But in your case, what you're going to want to do is, uh, so for your front three speakers, they're all pretty close to each other uh, and pretty close to you, you know, in, in a relative sense. Uh you know what you what you're trying to do is just like if you were setting your subwoofer it'd be very similar you know it's going to it's going to try to level match your speakers based on uh, assuming that it's you know that the amplifier is at full power so in my uh, in my uh uh 
so overheads. I just have the receiver set to maximum power. I'm not the receiver, the, uh, the amplifier set to maximum mm -hmm. power, uh, which works fine. Now, it may be this B and K by pairing it up to the, to the maximum volume that the receiver is going to try to back it down too much. And if you see a negative 12 on the trim level, well, you know <laughs> right. you've got a problem here. But uh, so you just kind of want to get it to where the receiver has enough play to get it to level match each one of these each one of these speakers yeah so the uh, uh the bnk manual for this model actually says start with them turned all the way up because the the little potentiometers are only cuts they are not boosts they are only cuts um, oh okay yeah. there you go so yeah. they say have have those little potentiometers turned all the way up to start if you notice a noise floor problem or, or your av receiver cuts the trim level like crazy then you can turn those little potentiometers down to reduce the gain on the amplifier itself but unless there's an issue you leave them turned all the way up they mention the case where maybe you have a mix of different impedances on your speakers and because of that if you have a pre-amplifier that doesn't have trim levels then you can use that to level match all of your speakers speakers uh you know because some of these speakers are going to allow more power through if they have a lower impedance or something um but yeah in general you start with them turned all the way up that's even what the manual says okay so what are the cheapest <laughs> yeah. rca cables on amazon.ca we would recommend you just cut totally out and i'm plugged in this time okay yeah we've had a few little skype glitches here but uh yeah so amazon.ca i i would tell you just to go with amazon basics but uh, i did yeah. search real quick and there's some weird things where they're like only selling them in 10 packs or like weird links <laughs> i don't they seem to be out of stock right now so uh i don't know like it really doesn't matter rca cables there was what was the one by jns there was like some reasonable ones from some brand called jns that i don't know about them but they look totally fine there's no problem with them and they seem reasonable and the mono price ones on right. amazon are overpriced and just one cable and prime cables both charge shipping which uh yeah so it's rca cables man like pretty much anything will do <laughs> You gotta have something someplace. <laughs> I, mean, you I know. Have Don't you have house. RCA cables lying around that came with your VCR and your DVD player? No. <laughs> so he asks, anything special that needs to be done with Odyssey? Uh, run it. Use the app. I guess. I mean, we went through the Odyssey tutorial last week. No, he's just meaning exactly. you know switching from having powered everything with his AV receiver to now no. powering some of his speakers with an external amplifier. Nope. You can just I mean, run it. I I would just run it. Yeah. Yep. So is there any add-on cooler? Is there any add-on cooler that we recommend for X? Oh, added cooler. Okay. Like a refrigerating. Okay. So is there anything that we would recommend for external amps and AV receivers to cool them? Maybe the AC infinity units? Um, air. <laughs> space <laughs> space is what i would recommend because it's so cheap you know all you have to do is not set stuff down on top of each other and give it some air and that's it um yeah just open as many you know keep it as open as possible and you should be fine the only time i've ever really run into heat issues i'll be honest with you uh because i haven't owned the onkyo receiver in a long time but the only time i've really mm. run into heat issues is the xbox 360 yeah <laughs> Uh, and I put that at the bottom of my rack at first. and my receiver started shutting off right? Uh, because of heat. So I took it out of the rack because this was actually an enclosed rack, which had cooling fans and everything. It was just don't put it at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Took it out of my rack and everything was fine. Uh, most of these devices, and with some exceptions, uh, you know, have very high tolerances for, you know, if, if the, recommend, the recommendations that they give you uh, are extremely generous you know it's not that big and they probably don't need to have as much air as they're recommending but it's really easy just to just to keep things open if you can uh that would be the the number one recommendation and you know you're like oh well i've got this really nice cabinet and blah 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 i'm like okay dude um does it need a back <laughs> can you just take can you take the whole back off of this cabinet does it have to be there uh you know, can you drill a bunch of holes in there? I mean, you can put in, and I mean, we're talking about 12 volt triggers anyways, you can put in like uh, cooling fans and uh, or just airflow fans that can like blow air through your no, cabinet. That's, that's it, what the AC Infinity units are. So they're just, yeah. they're just shaped to fit nicely in a rack. Um, yeah. So our, our, our friend DJ over at the Brightside Home Theater Podcast, he swears by the AC Infinity unit. I haven't used one myself, but uh, but he swears by it. So I, I'm willing to take that as a, uh, a, a, a vouching for it, a vote of confidence. Um, yeah, they're, they're common. They're not too expensive. And if you 
are needing some additional fan cooling, the AC Infinity units seem like a pretty good choice. Okay. Yeah. And you know what's... Yeah, it's just cheaper just not to have to do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jason. So I did use some of Jason's pictures in yeah. my... Uh, in my stuff so if we didn't mention jason before i definitely did in fact i took Last one of his pictures did. and yeah and i put a put a thing on it um temperature okay thing because i was talking about heating up home theaters ah. so all right jason jason wrote this a while ago to ask if uh he would benefit from adding in ceiling atmos speakers in this theater which has a low six foot seven inch ceiling and bipole surround and surround back speakers mounted about one foot below the ceiling and he's got a bunch of pictures here his home theater is very nice very it clean is. And I wish mine looked this good. <laughs> yep, I'm envious of the looks, all right. <laughs> <sighs> so we both basically said we probably wouldn't add Atmos speakers to his existing setup, but what if he swapped his bipole surround and surround backs for monopoles and lowered them so they just have a clear line of sight to every seat? Would that make enough of a difference that we think he would benefit from adding overhead speakers? I think you should add overhead speakers so that you can stop asking us about it. <laughs> it sounds like he wants to add some He kind of wants to, That's and he's looking, for, like. he's looking for somebody to enable him. And you know what, sir? If I was here, I would offer you a beer and some overhead speakers. All right? Uh, you know, I mean, as Why as not? I said the first time, I, uh, I, I, uh, he even quoted me. I said, "I'm come see, come saw on that. Uh, that I'm not going to stop you if you want to do it because I don't think it's going to harm your setup. Uh, I also don't think that you're a person who who vitally needs Atmos speakers. So if you want to do it, I I say go for it. I mean, I think it's 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 top fronts uh, or top height, uh, rear front heights and top middles. I think is what makes the most hmm, sense in here. Really. Uh, I mean, he doesn't hit the he. I know he says he's going to lower. I mean, yeah, you wouldn't have rear that. heights on the back wall because even if you lowered, yeah. lowered that those surround back speakers, the uh, rear heights on the back wall would be very close to them. Yeah. <laughs> They'd be sitting on but, top I mean, of yeah. each other. It seems to me like that would be the best way to go with this. I mean, if you want top fronts and top, yeah, top rears, fronts, top rears, yeah, you could you could do it, but. Them. Yep, I do. I do so, top front, top rears. That's that's what I do in this setup. Yeah. So he's got a Denon X forty five hundred H receiver. Would adding a separate amp improve sound quality? What about switching completely to separates? Nope. And nope is what I would recommend here. Yeah, this Don't is not those a large things. room. Uh, no. There is no chance that you need significant external power to run these speakers. No, no way, no how. Um, no. No, just don't do it. Spend your money elsewhere. That's not the place to spend money in this setup. Yeah. He doesn't have any room treatments yet, and you're asking us about amplifiers? <laughs> right. Although the room is fully carpeted, does he need panels? Yes. What criteria are used to determine if they would be, be beneficial? Um, go in your room and go like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> does it... Does do you hear a echo or a uh, does it ring a little bit? Because that'll tell you something. Or give right you a there. little zing. You you, you go clap right. zing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a that's a that'd be a good indication. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have uh, really even bass across all your seats? I mean, mm -hmm. I know you have. It looks like you have your your subwoofer set up properly. I can't really tell, but I think you do. I think there's one in the front and one in the back. Yes, the way it yeah. Looks. yeah. He's trying that out. The middle of the front so, wall, middle of the back wall. That will help a lot, but mm -hmm. you know that bass trapping will help even more. Putting some acoustic panels in here will help even more. So, uh, th we talked about it before. Thirty percent of the room. Yep. Uh, you're nowhere near that. You're a one sixth of the room, and it's not even all that thick. You know? <laughs> so, with just the carpet on the floor. So, yes, you need to put some panels up. I would put some panels up. I don't know that you need is a strong word, but I would definitely do it if it were me. So we took measurements in, in Rumi Q Wizard, and this was with a 7.1 configuration. He just recently started experimenting with having a second sub positioned in the middle of the back wall, but the measurements he did he sent, I'm sorry, he sent did not include that second sub. He does not consider himself experienced in interpreting graphs, but to his eye, it looks like the 150 to 200 hertz region has some issues and maybe some of the lower base, which he presumes would be handled mostly by adding a second sub as opposed to the absorption panels. With our eyes, what do we think? And do we think panels would be beneficial? Uh, where should they place? How thick? How large in absorption or diffusion? Not diffusion. So you have, I don't know what the, it, I can't, there's nothing on here that tells me what your smoothing is. So Oh, I, I actually added this smoothing because you just sent the raw file. So this is 1 24th of an octave smoothing. Oh, okay. So 
uh, not very smooth. <laughs> so this, there's a lot of variance here. It looks like you're going from, uh, I can't really read the sides here. Yeah, no, I mean, th this is a, a small scale. So uh, yeah. like the, these are not wild swings. So the average, yeah. it, for some reason, it was like a 68 uh, decibel <laughs> was like the, the nominal. So like the peaks okay. are going up to maybe 74, 75. I think the worst one is 76. So we're talking about, you know, peaks that are like maybe six or seven decibels and then troughs about the same. So at the right. worst point, you're seeing maybe a plus minus six or seven db um most of it you're within the plus minus three db but he is correct that that by and large in all the channels going through uh front and center and surrounds that um other than the deep deep bass which we're not going to worry too much especially from the speakers we're not we're not going to worry what the speaker measurements look like in the deep bass uh but the largest peaks and dips that we're seeing are between 100 and 500 hertz and that is precisely where passive treatments are going to help you. They're going to help you in the crossover region between speaker and subwoofer, and they're going to help you in that upper base region. That's where absorption panels are going to do the most. So if you are looking for an additional indication besides the clap test of would adding some acoustic panels in your room be a help for you, almost certainly yes. You are the prime yeah. candidate where what you have is really not bad. We need to stress that. People are going to look at you know, squiggles on these graphs and go, hey, that's not a perfectly flat line. But again, keep in mind, most of this is plus or minus 3 dB. At worst, it's plus or minus 6 or 7 dB. Um, so that is already really quite good. And the worst of it is happening exactly where panels will help you in that 100 to 500 right. hertz range. So looking at your room, you asked where panels should go. Um, so he's got like what looks to be wainscoting, though it might just be a different color in his room for, mm -hmm. at one point uh, about the height of wainscoting. And then above the wainscoting, he's got some posters. Yep. And below, he's just got nothing down there. And it's just nothing. So, uh, you know, the, the I'm going to say issue, if, if, I, if, I, if I will, it is wainscoting. No, I, I just saw, looked at a different picture. It is a wainscoting. The issue would be the, the, the panels want to be right across that line of wainscoting uh i mean they so, gotta at least be at your ears got it, yeah so um what i would recommend here is the is c talking to gick or somebody else and getting a uh if you don't want to go with just like hanging black panels on the wall and it's going to mess up this aesthetic that you kind of have going on if it were me i would in between where you've got your now even though your your posters are kind of where i want your um mm -hmm. your your first reflection points there and you could do uh, printed panels so you can have things yeah, that are I, pretty to go on the wall yeah, yeah yeah um i would this is what i would do i would take and get panels that fit within your wainscoting mm -hmm. on the bottom there that those those squares that you have down there that fit in there that have the Gulford of Maine matching fabric color sure. that's yeah you that's know, the same as the wall color there because they have like infinite colors mm -hmm. that go for me it's more expensive it's it, you know but we're looking to, to preserve the the aesthetic. if you are looking to preserve the aesthetic here then i would get those and just in every one of those little bays that you know in any one of those little squares i put one in every single one sure all the way along the, the bottom and then along the the top part of the wall i would either take and get wall color panels that are that match your paint and then place them where they need to be and then put the posters in between them okay or I would do what Rob said, which is uh, get printed panels and put them, you know, instead of the posters. Sure. The problem with that is that you couldn't take the posters and have that image printed because that one of them is definitely Godzilla, and the other one I yeah. think is Unforgiven. Uh, the ones I'm I can not sure. See. There's Star Wars. The um, Star Wars. Yep. You wouldn't be able but to do that. Yeah, Unforgiven? Unforgiven is one of them. I mean the the. Canadian hockey poster that would probably be okay. Can probably get away with that. There's a Sopranos poster in there. Yep. Yeah. So you would have to see what you could actually get away with as mm -hmm. far as that. And we have on AV Rant the Rob uh, W, not Rob H, Rob W's guide to printing panels and all that stuff. It's not easy. I've started the process myself and it's requires a little bit of Photoshop work in order to make it uh, work exactly the way if you're going to DIY it. Uh, if you're going to pay somebody else to do it, you still have to get the image ready for them to, to do it as well. So, uh, 
yeah, the, the, there, there's some some stuff there. But th that's what I would recommend. Sure. I mean, I, I, it seems to me that that makes the most sense. Yeah. Yes, it might cost a little more, but you will preserve the look of this very nice looking right. theater without, you know, just slapping some two two foot by four foot by you know two and a half three or two foot two inches by or four inches thick panels on the wall that overlaps this wainscoting and everything else yeah the money you were thinking of spending on separates you put it into panels instead and it'll much much better address the issues that you have now he did ask about diffusion and is there something in the measurements that can indicate whether diffusion would be beneficial for that we're going to look at the waterfall graphs we want to yeah, see I the, was looking at these. the decay times yeah. uh now diffusion is primarily what we're looking for is in the one to four kilohertz range uh that's where diffusion is going to have an effect and what we're looking for in the waterfall plots are uneven or rising decay times in that one to four kilohertz range that's would be in the measurements what would give us an indication that diffusion would be beneficial and going across all your speakers you don't have that you don't have that issue these are only going out to 200 milliseconds in the waterfall plots that i created you're just not i mean it's it's not a perfectly smooth even line of course right people again are going to look at it and go oh that's not an even no we're, we're looking for very obvious troughs or you know mountains coming way forward in the graph on certain frequencies between one and four kilohertz to tell us that diffusion is really really needed in this room and we're just not seeing that it's just not the case right. um so that is not what you need. You are the candidate for absorption panels, and that is where to spend your money in here. I gotta scroll. I gotta scroll. There's too many. There's a lot pictures. of photos. Oh, are we done with? This we're stuff done with that. Pictures. With that. Yes, that's okay. It. All right, I'm scrolling. Oh, we're done. Period with this question. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. So the the base section here. Um, well, again, this know, was only just... with one sub though, so it's almost yeah. You know. And, and I'm wondering too, it, 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 as I look at this, you see some issues in, with just a subwoofer by itself. Sure. You know how much that's going to change with the two subs together. Yeah. So we're going to get both those subs together. We're going to do those measurements over again. You're going to get these panels. That's and we'll right. See. And don't forget about corner trapping either. I would definitely consider corner trapping in this room. You've got the corners for it, Mike. Mike has his TV and 5.1 speaker system in his living room. The living room is open to his great room via 46-inch wide, 8-foot tall doorway. But there's no door, just a permanent opening. It's an arch. Uh, he isn't looking for full soundproofing, but he is hoping to reduce sound transmission by at least a few decibels, and he definitely wants to be able to block the light. So he wants to know if there's a type of curtain that will serve his purposes. For aesthetic reasons, he would want the fabric showing on both sides of the curtain, uh, not exposed vinyl or any type of plastic surface to any ideas. Uh, lead. <laughs> I mean, like the stuff we're not like the that stuff you wear with, <laughs> the, the stuff you wear when you're getting an X-ray, okay? And then you put you put you put a, a curtain of that, and on either side of it, you also hang a curtain of the color fabric you want because the fabric curtains not gonna do. You really need mass to stop this yeah. from going through, and some and, and and the heavier the curtain, the, the better, and so, preferably. Uh, uh, some kind of seal because really what you yeah. want is like a like a velcro seal all around this thing that that's what's going to do it i mean uh, i've pointed people before to trademark soundproofing uh for a window solution that they have now it's not very pretty it is a piece of mass loaded vinyl that is sandwiched yeah. in between layers of insulation and it looks like a vinyl quilted like packing material like you know what you use for in movers you know movers you live it, blankets if yeah, yeah. If you live in Florida, it looks like hurricane, there you the, go. like the fabric hurricane covers they put up over windows. And so I was exactly thinking that's like that. that's probably not what you want. And thankfully, there's a company called Residential Acoustics that makes something I think is pretty reasonable. Uh, again, uh, they're showing it with windows, but you can get it. I, I checked to make sure you can get it in the size you need to cover your entire doorway, and you absolutely can. Uh, they call it their Acousta Track. Uh, now, they have other ones that are very similar to the trademark soundproofing that just kind of hang on hooks and Velcro to the sides of your windows, but the acoustic track actually goes on like a normal looking, you know, curtain rod type of thing, although it's a little bit reinforced because these things are heavy. Uh, they are mass loaded vinyl with uh, just some insulation on either side. And in the case of the residential acoustics, acoustic track one with fabric on either side with your choice of fabric color. Uh, it comes with everything you need to seal around the window or in your case doorway. And you would have this, you know, regular sort of curtain rod track above to uh, open and close. Uh, to make it look like more or less a normal curtain. So it's not cheap uh, to get the size no. that you're needing. You're going to be close to 500 bucks, I think, <laughs> Which at which point I'm like, 
could you put in a door? Because I think you're getting pretty darn close to door yeah, installed I, cost at that I point. I don't really see this as being a viable option, you know, not in a house. I mean, you look at the door yeah. that he's, you know, this would be just kind of in the middle. And then you'd have to have the ceiling stuff. I mean, the stuff to seal it, the, the, the Velcro or whatever Yeah, it is, Velcro around the door all jam. All around the outside. That would just, and then that's not coming off easy. No. Yeah, that's not, it's yeah, industrial I mean, adhesive that, to put that on there because it's meant to stick. Yeah, I the mean, paint you, and the everything else is coming off with it. You can do it without the Velcro seal, but then you might as well not because the the flanking yeah. that comes through the gap. It's it's really about having having it sealed around the door or window jam. That's what makes it actually you know cut down the sound. It will absolutely block the light if that is the only thing you want to do. Right. It is one hundred percent opaque. Issue. We can do that, yeah, but we can do blocking most of the light just with a curtain rod and. That's right. You know, I some, mean, even the ugly one, even the the curtains. trademark soundproofing one the ugly one it's not cheap that's like 350 bucks for that one and it doesn't yeah. even look pretty so when you're talking about those kind of prices i'm like uh, even like a bi folding door can you put a bi folding door in here or something <laughs> it's uh, yeah, a bi folding door is going to rattle like crazy know, but uh, yeah i uh, honestly you know light transmission that's not an issue mm -hmm. 20 30 dollars for a curt a couple of curtains right 20 30 dollars for a curtain rod and Bob's your uncle. You could do that easy. Oh, That's yes. not a problem. It's not going to do anything for uh, your sound, but it's not going to do anything for your sound. It's block the but then again, honestly, you're not going to do anything for your sound anyways. <laughs> uh, it, it's not going to happen. Uh, and it's not. Be, and, and I and I 100. percent I would if you, if I listen to me make this recommendation to myself after I had asked this question, mm -hmm. I'd be like, you lost your damn mind. I'm not doing that for that. And amount I don't of money. blame you. If it was a lot for cheaper, that, maybe, but no. Well, even even if it was free, I'd be like, well, it's gonna there's gonna be velcro, the velcro around, around the door. door jam. Yeah, that's a, usually a no go. Yeah, know. that's. I mean, even when you so you pull it across, and people are like, what's that black line going across? Even if it's not black, what's that weird line going across the top of your door? Yeah, I mean, they, they, you know, it's the white cover. velcro, and the the soft side is the part that actually goes against the door jam, and the the hooks are what is attached to the curtain. I mean, it, yeah, it's kind of conceivable, but yeah, I kind of doubt it. Yeah, so uh, the easiest solution here is just to turn it down. <laughs> I, mean, I hate to say it. There's your I mean, there's your two or three decibels that you're trying to get out. Just turn it down. You you can but, you uh, can make a regular curtain. You can make it way more pleated than you need to cover the span. It's still not going to do virtually anything for the sound, but it will block the light. Uh, you might get the slightest like. Literally, if someone is, you know, whistling in the kitchen, it, it might cut that down by like 4 dB. You know, if that's if that's literally all you're asking for, then just get some regular drape material and make some regular drapes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this comes from Anonymous. Mm -hmm. uh, not... So anonymous once once a new pre pro or AV receiver that will be used as a pre pro for around a grand that will support Atmos, ETSX, and some form of room correction and and importantly the Cuba music streaming whatever uh, service as a critical listening source. What do we suggest? Um, I, I, uh, <laughs> I suggest you go to accessories for less and get sure. the receiver the whatever receiver Denon or Marantz or Yamaha fits the number of speakers and stuff that you need and then buying a separate Cubas or whatever it's called a uh, streaming player and you're still under a thousand dollars unless those well, players are like really expensive i don't know how much those players are costing. yeah well so this is the thing so cobuzz is not supported on on a ton of things and the streaming players that it that do support it are like 350 dollars and up um it's not going to be found on your on your little 50 dollars streaming sticks unfortunately uh and in terms of avi receivers that support it uh built in den and Amarantz do not but yamaha does uh, so I would probably encourage you to just get a Yamaha receiver. Um, I think that's going to be your easiest path to this. However, um, getting one, because I mean, he says he's, he's trying to get this to do Atmos and DTS X. Now, if you're going to do that, we always recommend that you should have four overhead speakers. I don't necessarily want you to get just a seven channel model. And in Yamaha's right. case, um, you know, they've got the, the, the 1080 is, is still a seven channel maximum model. So you're looking at either the 2080 or the 3080 and the 2080 is nine channels max. That's it. You can't expand beyond that. So if what you want to do is stop at 5.1.4, the 2080 can be found on Accessories for Less. They're sold out of stock right now, uh, but hopefully some will be coming back into stock. But even at Accessories for Less, it's $1,500 for the 2080. And if you want a full 7.1.4 configuration, the 3080 is, you know, too great. Grand. So uh, getting all of this for your thousand dollar budget with four overhead speakers, like maybe he had in mind that he really just wanted five point 
1.2. But I, I would encourage you that if you're going to do Atmos and DTSX that you have the four overheads. Otherwise, you're not going to get front-to-back movement, and that's that's part of the fun. Um, so I would point you at Yamaha. Uh, I'm hoping, crossing my fingers, that 5.1.4 is enough because then the 2080 is kind of reasonable. I mean, even if you got a $1,000 Denon receiver and added one of the $350 streaming devices, you're getting pretty close to that price anyway. Um, right. And the Yamaha is going to be easier instead of dealing with a separate device. So Yamaha RXA 2080, that's where I'm pointing you, but it's not going to hit the $1,000 mark. So, yeah. All right, Lee. This is not Lee Overstreet. This is a different one. Lee added a second SVS 2000 series subwoofer. Uh, this only practical place to put it is in his rear corner, right behind his couch. Uh, he used Rob's 12-step guide and everything sounds great. But the seat closest to the new sub has become f- the physically rumbly seat. Mm-hmm. And his kids fight over who gets to sit there. <laughs> so now Lee is thinking he would like to add some butt kickers. Wait. Your kids want to sit They there. want it. They want the well, seat. Well, then what's rumble. the problem? They want to There's sit in the corner one. where it sa- the sounds of the boards. Well, you know, it's, you make it a reward. Dude, how long have you been a parent? <laughs> let me ask. Let me tell you something. You find something your kids want to fight over. That's the thing you take away. That's the thing. That's the carrot that you dangle in front of them to get them to do stuff. I'm sorry. Which one of you is my favorite today? Because you're going to be sitting in the, in, the, in the rumble seat. You don't you don't unrumble it. You keep it rumbly. Oh, my God. Goodness. Oh, we did shotgun for a while in my uh, house. You know shotgun, right? Sure. You call shotgun to see who gets in the front seat. Yeah. It became such a deal. It was starting fist fights. So now <laughs> I choose yes. shotgun. And they're like, hmm, which one does daddy like best today? Maybe I should go do some dishes or something. Mm-hmm. doesn't work as often as I would like, but it works sometimes, which is what this should do. So anyways, uh, the rumbly seats and his kids want to uh, fight over who gets to sit there. So now Lee is thinking he would like to add some buck. Oh, you see? That's a problem. Butt kickers. Now everybody's seat's rumbly. When everybody's super, nobody's super, <laughs> right? right? Didn't, the, didn't the Incredibles teach us this? Mm. See, it won't be special. Now nobody will want it. You said, I'm telling you, <laughs> just leave the rumble seat the rumble seat. So he has a Yamaha RX A1080 receiver, and he's already using both subwoofer outputs. So how does he connect the butt kickers and wire it all up together? Well, sir... Mm. I just wrote an article about this. We got the article for you. (laughs) AV Gadgets, how to add a tactile, how to add tactile transducers to your home theater is the name of the article. It's very easy to to find. It's exactly the answer to the question that you have. Uh, And the answer is not as simple as you might be envisioning. No. Um, No. Yeah. So the answer is very, very simple if you don't use room correction. Uh, <laughs> okay. And I'm pretty the sure he does you with add, the Yamaha. Yeah, yeah, I'm pretty sure he does too. So, because uh, he went through this 12 sub thing and everything. Right. So, what ends up happening with tractile, tactile transducers is that they need the the subwoofer output. Yes. Okay. From your from your your LFE output, and then it goes into an amp, uh, an external amp that they then use a low pass filter to send just however much information you want from you know, the receipt, the LFE signal into the tactile transducers. That's great. Mm-hmm. Okay, that works just fine. There's no problems there. You can choose it. You can choose how how much gain it has on the amplifier, which means how much is it rumble and all that, which is fine. Uh, but when you add a room correction, you're now going to, your, your room correction is going to start EQing those low frequencies. Mm-hmm. Uh, how much depends on the room correction system you're using and everything else. So, then we run into some issues, and that those issues are it's boosting or cutting low frequencies based on how your room is interacting with those base frequencies. From the actual and subwoofers playing from, real from sound. From the actual yeah. subwoofers, right. So, but your your butt kickers need an unadulterated That's signal. That's right. <laughs> because that unadulterated signal is it is basically flat, right? And it, it, it's, you know, when... it. it it's not being affected by the room at all, so it doesn't need to be EQ. Yeah. So if you're EQing your subwoofers, you now have to un-EQ yes. your butt kickers. Yeah. So how do you do that? Well, the easiest way is to get a mini, mini DSP. And well, a mini DSP... I, I would say what, in his case, since he has a Yamaha, and his Yamaha is one of the units that we know can keep playing your immersive audio in your main zone while creating a two-channel down mix for zone two. Okay. 
Yes. So in okay. his case, because Lee has a Yamaha that can do this, his easiest solution is to going is going to be to use zone two to feed the amplifier that's powering the butt kickers. And you're going to say, uh, unless you're somehow already using zone two for something else, but you know what? Uh, the, take it back. Um, you're going to, you're <laughs> going to keep playing whatever you're playing in immersive audio surround sound in the main zone. And you're going to duplicate that same source out of zone two. And zone two is going to feed your butt kicker because the zone two is a two channel down mix of all the sounds and it is not applying EQ to those sounds right. in the zone two open. So, so in, in Lee's case, that'll work. And that's detailed in the AV gadgets uh, write right. up that if you have a receiver that can do that, you can use the zone two output method. And for him, it, it, it'll it work. Yamaha does it right. <laughs> you just have to make sure that your zone two and your uh, main zone volumes sure. go up and down at the same time. <laughs> so you may have to do a little finagling with your harmony Unless he wants to set the butt kicker at a stuck level and just leave it there because... Yeah, it could be. Yeah. It could be you prefer it that way. Yeah. You, know, you don't want the butt kicker to shake any less or any more uh, when you are uh, changing the volume of everything else. I think that would be weird, especially if you turned it down low. Right. And then all of a sudden the, the couch is starting to shake uh, violently because there's an explosion and you're like... <laughs> What? What was that? But yeah, so what, that's uh, just me. what Tom was saying for everyone else who doesn't have a receiver that can do zone two output that is down mixed while retaining full immersive audio in the main zone, because that's most of us or AV receivers don't do that. Uh, then yeah, you need to make a reverse equalization curve and load that into a mini DSP to undo what your room correction has done to the pace <laughs> and then feed that corrected and right. then decorrected signal to your butt kicker amplifier and that's like what the the mini dsp plus a microphone yeah it's gonna cost you like 200 bucks it's gonna cost you about 200 bucks like on top of yeah. the amplifier and the of, butt kickers yeah. yeah so unfortunately that's just sort of the way it is somebody someday if and i don't know that it'll <laughs> ever happen but if if butt kickers ever became so popular oh, dedicated that a lot of tactile them, transducer outputs yeah. Yes. Well, not only that, but uh, maybe receivers would start giving you the ability to uh, to have the dual independent mm -hmm. subwoofers, one EQ'd, one not. Right. Uh, well, I mean, the other option some of the expensive pre-pros allow you to do that. Uh, the sure, the that, turn off and yeah, stuff like they'll, that. They'll let you do three or five subwoofer <laughs> outputs, so they'll let you do it, but that's... You know, that's I, I know you know when I wrote that article because I had you look it over, yeah. but uh, it sat there for a really long time. Do you know why it sat there for so long before I published it? That I'm not sure. The Trinov website had gotten hacked uh, or something, and it was completely down. Hacked. I could not get to the. I could not link to it. <laughs> like I wanted to link to it right. so that people could go see it, and that was yeah. it was ridiculous. Anyway, so yeah, you're gonna end up. Uh, if someday somebody did really care enough about this, they would build a like a uh, an EQ mm. into their amp for the tra tactile drone transducers, but I would not hold my breath for that. <laughs> So if you're gonna if you have a Denon or Marantz or something that will not give you that zone two that you're looking for, then you will have to uh, spend an extra two hundred dollars plus whatever right. effort it takes to do the room. And the to, the, to the newest the, the newest Denon and Marantzes do they now do the two channel down mix for zone two, but only the ones that came out in twenty twenty or newer. Uh, and right. what was it the the X thirty six hundred H was the only two twenty nineteen model that did it. The one and only. All right, all right, Patrick. Patrick put out a press release saying that their new... Patrick. Uh, I'm sorry, Samsung. <laughs> I was like, wait a second, that doesn't sound right. Why was Patrick putting that? <laughs> Samsung put out a new pat, uh, press release saying their new 2021 uh, lineup of QLEDs, QLED TVs, will introduce HDR10 Plus Adaptive mm. and Filmmaker Mode. Cool. What are those? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, no. All right, so there was a thing called Dolby Vision IQ. It actually did exist in the 2019 LG OLEDs, although it didn't have the name yet. Uh, and then they officially gave it that name in the 2020 OLEDs, the C10 and whatnot. Uh, it was Dolby Vision IQ. And the idea there was most TVs come with a little ambient room light sensor. We almost always tell you to, you know, deactivate whatever picture mode makes use of the little ambient room light sensor but uh they decided hey we're gonna use that thing and if your room is something other than nearly pitch black uh we're gonna adjust the uh tone the the tone mapping curve a little bit to compensate for your room's ambient light level so that you know HDR, which can look very, very dark in anything other than a nearly pitch black room, uh, we can raise those shadows, shadows a bit and keep that shadow detail visible based on the little room ambient light sensor. 
So HDR10 Plus Adaptive is just the HDR10 Plus version of Dolby Vision IQ. It is using the little room light sensor to change the tone mapping curve based on your room's light levels. Uh, so if your room is bright instead of very, very dim, it'll change a little bit, try and keep all the shadows visible. Uh, the filmmaker mode, of course, is the thing that just turns off all the things that the uh, TV manufacturers put in, like your motion smoothing, your frame interpolation, your edge enhancement, uh, your incorrect colors where it goes to the panel's native color gamut instead of the, you know, correct Rect 709 or Rect 2020 gamut. It, it turns off all the crazy processing uh, by actually activating filmmaker mode. So uh, Samsung was kind of late to that party, but they're going to be adding it in. And yeah, that's what those things are. All right. Very exciting. <laughs> JR. JR is trying is back and trying to figure out how to add surround back speakers to his setup. Don't. He predicted that you might say that, but yes. Yeah, I know. Reshowing the photographs in case it jogs your memory of... What his it has to like. because I have no idea what I'm looking at here. Okay, so the couch in the front, left, and right, and his six point is seven foot nine inch ceiling in the front, six foot nine inch ceiling in the back. He's got a home office and a treadmill in the back of his room, and uh, French doors back there. A big bookcase on the right. It looks like an opening to the stairs on the left, and some French doors over there as well. Yep. He's got acoustic foam everywhere mm -hmm. for because apparently he doesn't listen to this podcast. And the back of his room is pretty busy. That's yeah. the way I would describe it. Pretty and busy. And he's got the soffit that's directly overhead. His seats used to be farther forward. So uh, where, where we're seeing in the photos, things have changed since the photos. But this was a, a reminder of what things looked like. Oh, okay. Okay. It doesn't seem to have jogged Tom's memory. <laughs> no. So why are, why are there, where are there speakers on the ceiling? I'm a little confused about be, be, those used to be it. Those used to be his surround backs when his seat was farther forward. But uh, with his new speakers that he acquired, all these B and W speakers, he has pushed his seat farther back. And uh, yeah, he has, as detailed further down, he has moved his surrounds and all that. So oh, catching up. Anyways. Yeah. <clears throat> so he hasn't updated his photos yet, but he hasn't implemented our previous advice. His surround speakers have been moved back so that they are to the sides of his seats. And two pair of SVS Prime Elevation speakers have been ordered. They'll be mounted high on the front wall as front heights and against the soffit that is right above his head seats as top middles. He's already enjoying his Denon X3700H 3, receiver and Rotel 5 channel amp with his 5 BMW speakers. But he has his old Mirage speaker still in hand, and that's where the idea of surround backs comes in. He still has his treadmill and computer desk taking up the physical back wall. He could mount his Mirage speakers close to the ceiling, the printer that's on top, on the top shelf of the desk, and the frame pictures on the wall could be moved. I'm not looking at the pictures any more than you people yeah. are, so we're all in the same boat. <laughs> or he could use his old Mirage Center as a single surround back speaker, or he could put them on speaker stands behind his seats, although he isn't sure how awkward that might be and what he would need to do in terms of height of those speaker stands. Of course, the other option is to forgo surround back speakers entirely, but he has a good amount of space behind him and no speakers that are positioned behind his seats at all. So what will he be gaining and losing with surround backs versus no surround backs? And if he adds them, where did they get positioned? Okay, well, I don't know what's going on here, but okay. So he has speakers on his ceiling that her surrounds. Well, not or, anymore. Or top middles. I mean, they they used right. to be. Uh, he used to have. But now they're the top middles. Uh, well, no, well, uh, sort of. He's going to have prime elevation speakers that are to the ends, like uh, the left and right wall of that soffit. They're going to be acting as his top middles. Prime elevations there. He's going to have prime elevations high up on his front wall. Uh, right. you know, above his front left and right speakers. Uh, but yeah, the, the speakers that you're seeing mounted on that soffit right now, they're not there anymore, but he's like, could he repurpose those on the actual back wall or on speaker stands behind his seats as surround backs? That's the question. Can you? Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't see, I mean, sure, whatever. <laughs> it's all about angles, dude. Yeah, right. so that's what you have to kind of worry about more than anything is the angles. Uh, you're going to have your surrounds low to your sides and then the, the top middle is high to your sides mm -hmm. and then your surround backs are going to be where if they're on the back wall, they're not on the back wall. I don't really think it matters. And they could be high up. I think the, the angles are, would still work for yeah, you. Yeah, because it's not as though you're world replicating world. rear heights in this setup. Right. So if they if they were up high, that's, that's not the end of the world. Uh, I mean, you know, 
you're thinking because the room is not that gigantic overall that it's a lot of space, but it's like 11 feet behind you. And if you had some surround backs on the back wall, 11 feet behind you, that's no different than having front speakers 11 feet in front of you. It's not like it's not going to work. Um, right. So it's really just a matter of do you have the physical space to put them on that back wall? Like my inclination looking at the way things are back there, because do I really want a surround back speaker that's like hanging right next to me while I'm on the treadmill? Um I, I would probably opt for speaker stands if you can. You can definitely get taller speaker stands. You know, they don't have to be 24-inch speaker stands. They can be 30 or 36-inch speaker stands. Uh, right, and if these are small enough speakers, they have like those like weird wire-looking ones too that more look like they're uh, uh, like microphone stands. Right. <laughs> you know, they have like kind of the, the tripod at the bottom and that sort of yeah. thing. I mean, I'd, uh, for these, clip, I'd probably just cl- get the uh, the video secu ones that are actually height yeah. adjustable and have little clamps on the sides to hold the speakers yeah. nice and steady. So I, that would probably be what I would do as long as it's not going to be too much of a problem getting to your desk at the back of the room, which it shouldn't really be if you've got a couple of speaker stands behind your couch. Um, I mean, if you think about where you're going to put them behind your couch yeah. in order to, uh, to make them into surround backs on stands yeah. and you just follow that line back to the back wall that's where they should go on right. the back wall exactly uh so if you want them on the wall or you want them on the stands i wouldn't do the, the, the single the, surround back i wouldn't opt for no. that i'd have the two um so i mean i would i can make the argument i'm the i'm the opposite of tom where where i can make the argument that when you when you have no other speakers that are behind you and you do have 11 feet of space behind you uh you know yeah. if there is a circling pan that goes all the way around you yeah that that can create an audible gap will that bother I would you agree I'm, no, okay. I'm not that bad i would agree with that <laughs> stop i would agree you're always so anti surround back so um i'm anti a lot of stuff <laughs> So yeah, I, I think you're you're in a scenario where it can make some sense to have those surround back speakers. I would opt to put them on some video secu height adjustable stands if at all possible. All right. Uh, he also asks, his Denon X3700H has nine built-in amps. He's got a f- his five-channel Rotel amp. Will the surround backs need to be powered by the Rotel? Well, again, it's just like the last person who asked this question. It all depends on whether or not you can assign and how you can assign the amps in the 3700H. Uh, and I, again, it will definitely work if you have, how many, it's got nine amps? No, no, it's got five channels. If you have your front three powering, sure. being powered by the Rotel, and the the other two powering one of the other ones, but yes, something will need to be powered by the Rotel uh, for sure. Um, I mean, he was actually he's got nine amps. He was actually more wanting to power all five of his B and W speakers, and he was concerned that, that the surround backs have to be powered externally. No, that is that is actually never no. the case uh, with the thirty seven hundred H. The thirty seven hundred H has its nine amplifiers built in. Uh, it's you, got like eleven terminals, though, right? Yeah, it's got that's eleven right. or thirteen terminals. Yeah, it's, it's, ridiculous. Got, it's got eleven preouts, and those eleven preouts, uh, all of them are hot all the time. Like if you're gonna go with these surround backs and have a seven point one point four configuration in terms of channels, all eleven of the speaker preouts are uh, there and ready to be used at all times. What it does have you do in the menu is assign which of those two preouts must be connected to an external amplifier because it only has nine amps built in, so two of them have right. to be external. And it only gives you two options: either which would your be the fronts, yeah, the your front, front left and right, left or and the right. middles. <laughs> <laughs> your front left and right have to be powered externally, which you can go ahead and use that because you are planning to power your front left and right with your external Rotel amp for sure. At which point, the nine built-in amplifiers could be used to power your surrounds, your surround backs, your four overheads, and your center. You can. Still do that uh, uh, with the front left and right are the only things not being powered by the Denon at that point, and that's fine. Or the other option is my rearmost, atmost speakers must be powered externally. So those are the only two options. It's never the surround backs in the case of the right. Denons. So you are fine. You can most definitely power your five B and W speakers with your Rotel amp the way that you want to, and the Denon will power the other six. So the mismatching subwoofers question, he asks, I guess, whatever. The, he intends to get the PC2000 Pro Cylinder, the subs that we suggested, but he can only afford to get one right now while saving up for, to get the second later. He already has his B&W subwoofer on hand. So what are the pluses and minuses? Does it really make sense to have the B&W sub on hand but not use it just because it isn't identical to the PC2000 Pro? I mean, it's on hand. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how... I don't remember what the... What the 
what how good the sub was because I don't remember. It's about a thirty about hertz this. sub. I mean, so you've got two subs that play down to thirty, mm-hmm. and one sub that plays everything below that. That's right. So I mean, is it gonna? The, the problem that becomes if it tries to play below 30 yeah. and then, in fact, adds noise and distortion to the room, at which point uh, it's doing more harm than good. If it plays down to 30 and then just kind of drops off and doesn't do anything, well, then I, I'd be fine. I mean, yeah, it's it's not I, I, optimal, it's but fine. it's also not forever. You are planning to get a second PC 2000 Pro when you can use it. Yeah, what we're looking for, I mean, if you have two different brand and model subs, but they are nearly identical in their performance capabilities, that is no problem whatsoever. We don't care. They don't have to be literally identical. We're trying to have two subwoofers that have similar output and extension capabilities because then you truly have two subwoofers working across the entire frequency range together. Once you have one subwoofer that can't play as low or can't play as loud or both as the other sub it's a little bit of a weakest link in the chain you know you've got two subwoofers as far as the capabilities uh, that both subwoofers can supply but then only one of them can now go louder or lower and if you try to get the weaker sub to do the same thing you can run into some issues of noise and distortion or or bigger problems than that bottoming out if it's really bad so yeah that that's the the concern there it is absolutely fine to give it a try <laughs> You've, it's right, right there it's sitting right there it's absolutely fine to give it a try if you start to notice that you're getting some odd sounds or bad distortion or something like that you take the bnw sub out of the equation and rely on one sub until you can afford its partner later yeah. chris uh how are we doing on time wise oh yeah we're doing great yeah. chris says thanks so much for recommending the Re- Re- revel m8 on wall speakers in white finish that were on sale at Crutchfield. They're the perfect size and looks for what his sister needs. And their complete lack of basis in the problem since she actually has a Dayton Sub 1000 that Chris got for her a while ago. He's got a pair of Polk TL1 satellite speakers on hand. They're tiny, a white finish, and they were cheap. They didn't sound any better than the Dayton speakers his sister was already using, but would they be okay to use as surrounds along with the Re- uh, Revel M8s up front? I mean, they're surrounds, dude. Yes. I mean, they're surrounds. <laughs> they're surrounds. And again, how discerning are we talking about that? Because I, I think that's what our, my comment was last week was yeah. like, who cares if there's bass or not? They're not going to care. So, uh, yeah, if it's not a discerning person, even if it is a discerning person, and uh, there's something to be said for this. It's like low-key passive-aggressive, but um, <laughs> you, know, you give them something that's just good enough to give them a taste of what mm. the good stuff is, but not so good that they... Don't want to like go, how come your sound's so much better than mine? That's sort of where you want, that's a sweet spot <laughs> right there for the passive aggressive AV helper outer. So uh, getting out there and getting that person some fairly crappy, but not so crappy surrounds, uh, make them say, well, you know what, I wish it sounded a little bit better. I mean, oh, I, think, yeah, well. I think a little bit of the context is that uh, like the M8s that are on sale at Crutchfield right now, I, we don't anticipate they'll be at that sale price for, for forever. Yeah. And, uh, and in fact, I think like, They've got the M8 version 2 now sort of thing. So they're kind of just selling off the M8s that they had at this discounted price. So I think he was wondering, like, should he go ahead and spend $400 instead of $200 to get four of them? Because it's going to be that important to have M8s matching all around, including in the surround positions. Or can he use these Polks that he already has on hand and are already in a white finish and already physically fit? Yeah, go ahead and use the Polks. Don't don't go spending an additional $200. You really don't need to use the Polks. (laughs) I agree. Corey. Uh, Corey has a light-controlled room and a 135-inch Elite screen. Uh, it's a white projection screen. He'd like to get a 4K projector, but keep the price well below $1,500. He's considering the BenQ TK800 or the Optima UHD30. Do we lean strongly into one or the other, or perhaps a different model entirely? He wants the sharpest picture with the smoothest motion for sports. I, I don't know. I got nothing. Uh, so, Corey, I'm, I'm going to give you the straight answer, the answer I would want to hear if I were in your position. I don't know how super happy you will be because I, I am going to advise you to spend more money than the TK800 or the UHD30. It's still going to be 
well, just under $1,500. It's going to be $1,500. Uh, and that would be BenQ's HT 3550. Uh, the gap in performance between the TK800, which is right at about eleven or $1,200, and the $1,500 HT 3550 is huge. It is a monstrous difference in performance with the HT 3550 looking so much better. Uh, the, the color accuracy right out of the box is really good on the HT 3550 and pretty poor on the TK800. The Optima UHD30 is right in the same class as the TK800. They're business class projectors that have been put into a home theater style chassis. They don't have accurate color. They're all just about sheer brightness. Their black levels are bad. <laughs> it's, they're, they're, I just, I can't wholeheartedly recommend, especially when like $300 more, you're getting a really darn good projector with the HD3550. It does have a frame interpolation if you want to add that for sports and have ultra smooth motion. It does HDR surprisingly well, which the other ones technically can take an HDR signal, but really can't show it to you uh, any different than SDR. So I'm hoping, you, you said $1,500 was the max. I'm like, I'm asking you to spend the max, but the performance is there. It is completely justifiable. And the BenQ HD3550 is where I would point you. All right, there you go. Nick. Nick will be using a pair of Rhythmic FV15HP subwoofers in his open basement. The theater area takes up a corner of the basement, but it's wide open, about 10,000 cubic feet in total. And it's not an enclosed rectangle, so he plans to use Rob's 12-step guide. Good, good. Mm -hmm. But here's what he's thinking. He's got three iPhones, I iPads on hand, and he could get three of the Dayton uh, IMM6 microphones plus a measurement app loaded into all three. Could he put an iPhone in three seats across his couch, play continuous white noise through his subs, and adjust the phase knob on one of the rhythmic subs until all three measure the same or as close to identical as possible? So he's trying to save some time on time, the 12-step right. guide, uh, the trial and error portion of adjusting the phase knob and saying, hey, can I use some electronic equipment to save some time on this? Um, so I was thinking about this for a bit because so playing white noise, which is all frequencies being played at equal signal volume, uh, if you're playing that out of both subs at the same time and then using a fast Fourier transform, which is definitely available in some of those apps to give you a reading of, you know, it would, it'll plot it out frequency by frequency. It'll look like a regular frequency graph. Um, and that should show you the, the relative amplitudes of all of your frequencies uh, through a fast Fourier transform. And then if you had, are seeing those in three different locations simultaneously, and adjusting until you get the most similar looking graph in all three positions, it should work. The thought experiment says, yeah, that that should well, work. That is actually, except that it, it summed everything up, but uh, that was kind of how the uh, the Velodyne SMS1 mm, right. system sort of worked. Uh, I do want to point out though, quickly and most importantly, three seats is not always three seats right i mean sure. you know it's it, you're not going to do the same thing that you could do the same thing that odyssey does which is put them like within two feet of each other mm -hmm. uh which i th i think is where I, I would not put them in three separate seats on my couch that is like a 10 foot couch uh, oh no he, he was saying like you know if he's got a uh like a five seater couch it'd be the middle three seats you know the the prime seat right in the middle and then the seat to either side Right. Yeah. So that's that's sort of the way I would do that. Mm -hmm. I would you, you still follow what we were talking about last week as far as, you know, side to side measurements. Uh, but yeah, this should work. I mean, like I yeah. said, it's very similar to the SMS1 uh, mm -hmm. system when they had the multi, I think they had like five or six mics that you could use. Right. I can't remember. Yeah. Now, what I would recommend uh, is because uh, the, the part that's throwing me a little bit is, is what's going to happen with white noise played out of subwoofers is that is that really going to give you an accurate reading? And I mean, it should. There's no particular reason why it shouldn't, in theory. I would just say, I mean, you're probably going to want to do this anyway. Once you've done it with your method, uh, still play a sweep and listen with your ears in each of the right. seats just to sort of confirm. Because I'm like, yeah, the sweep versus the white noise, I don't know if there's going to be anything strange about 
phase interactions or something like that. I, I was trying to puzzle it through, and I, I couldn't come up with a, uh, a logical reason why any wave interaction should, should give you an issue that way. But still, I wasn't completely sure. So, yes, I mean, I don't imagine why you wouldn't confirm with your ears with a bass sweep anyway, because, hey, it's just kind of fun to listen to the sweep and see how it goes. Uh, but it would be a lot fewer sweeps Rob's you'd be listening idea to. Fun, everybody else's ideas are oh, fun. Oh, man, yeah. My, my subs have played more sweeps than they have actual content. Uh, so, yeah, nice. it's, uh, you know, uh, I, I'm sure you will at the end of it, just to confirm. There you go. There you go. Uh, so this is the second question. I guess it got lost in the shuffle yeah, when you answered it. Yeah, I, I couldn't find this anywhere, so I, I don't know if it just never reached me or went to spam or something. But anyway, here it is now. So <laughs> maybe it came to me. Sorry, Nick. <laughs> uh, Nick got three pairs of uh, Send HTM200 SE speakers and three pairs of Monoprice wall mounts. We've recommended this particular wall mount before, as did Dave over at uh, Ascend, but Nick is disappointed with them. Mm. He's never had a problem with a Monoprice product before, but these just aren't up to snuff. The HTM200s are half the weight that the Monoprice says that these can hold, but the ball, ball joint simply doesn't hold them in place, and they sag down until the speakers are touching the drywall. So any other suggestions? Uh, Nick would be actually fine with a flush mount, but it would be nice if the speakers could be aimed just a little, but without sticking out from the wall very much. Um, yeah, sometimes those ball joints can be a little tricky yeah. uh, and they are just plastic not, so and it's a yeah. friction fit so it's just relying if you on plastic over tighten them yeah if you over tighten them you risk uh you know damaging the well, uh, yeah. and cracking the, the the ball joint which is what i do most of the yeah, time yeah especially plastic so, ones i could definitely yeah. see that have happened yeah yeah uh but yeah so what do you got rob yeah so actually we can uh thank um one of our one of our fellow listeners, because uh, he detailed out the um, like video secu. They have their inexpensive side clamping mounts. Now the arm that sticks out is six inches. It sticks out six inches from the wall, but that is the depth of the HTM 200 SE speakers anyway. And then uh, you know he was saying that well the the actual platform with the side clamping mounts it sticks out even a little bit farther and uh, yeah. wasn't a big fan of that but he discovered yeah you can just turn that around so that the part that normally sticks out now now sticks back towards the wall the clamps will now be at the back of the speaker instead of the front of the speaker but it works totally fine so uh now you're basically only sticking out maybe six and a half inches but it was going to anyway because that's the depth of the speaker and uh yeah so i would recommend the video sec you, uh side clamping wall mounts because they definitely hold the speakers very securely and you can aim them a little and just rotate the platform around so the clamps are at the back and now it won't stick out so far all right james James was watching the Ultra HD Blu-ray version of Flash Gordon on Bo Boxing Day. Like the original Flash Gordon? I uh, believe so. Uh, Came out on Ultra HD Blu-ray now. Did not realize that that was a thing. Yeah. I should make my kids watch that. They'll hate it. <laughs> the disc has a 5.1 DTS, DTS HD Master Audio soundtrack. During the opening sequence, there's a plane crash, and there's a very deep, very loud bass rubble. Rumble, not rubble. His pair of Kef R400B subwoofers both felt completely silent after that sound, and they have not made a sound at all since. Mm. Maybe it was a rubble. <laughs> <laughs> so the thing is, they still have power on, so he isn't actually sure if it's the subwoofers that have died or just the subwoofer outputs on his Denon. Uh, his X6200W receiver, he was using both subwoofer outputs. He cycled power on everything and tried rerunning Odyssey. There isn't a peep out of either of his Kef subs. So is there a way to troubleshoot to figure out whether it's the subs or the Denon's outputs? I... Uh, so you need that if it's the dentist's outputs, the only way to check it is to plug it into something else and see if it right. gets the sound to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it doesn't have something. to be a subwoofer. I mean, you can no. you can send yeah. uh, higher frequency sounds out of the subwoofer output like 200 hertz, and any speaker will play 200 hertz. So if you have some other separate amplifier, but you can right. also... Um, so I mean... Yeah, these days, most phones don't have headphone jacks anymore, but there's usually some way to rig a headphone jack <laughs> via some little right, dongle. dongle. Um, or maybe you have an older one, or maybe you have a tablet. A lot of tablets still have headphone jacks. Um, or actually, I mean, anything with a headphone jack that you can get uh, a sweep to play out of, or it doesn't even have to be a sweep, some kind of bass sound. Because as long as you have some other source you can plug into a powered subwoofer um right you just want to be able to play a sound so normally what i do is just i, I take my phone um because i still held on to some of my older phones that had headphone jacks and i just play sounds out of those via a 3.5 millimeter to rca cable 
uh, which is super cheap to get. So that is a way to you know have a source. Other it's almost than certainly the subs. I mean, I would not think it would I, be the receiver. I think it's the subs. And yeah, yeah I mean, I, th I think you, I think you broke the voice coils. Or <laughs> did something? You melted something down in there. Either that, um, or I mean, it what were these? It what could were just these? were Kef R four hundred Bs. But the, the amplifier is still showing power, so that's where I, yeah. I'm surprised that the, the Kefs wouldn't have uh, a fuse. A fuse that would somehow. But I mean, I also wouldn't expect a case. fuse to blow from playing a sound. Right. You know. So it's it, it could be the amp, it could be the driver, yeah. but it's almost certainly not the receiver. So I, I would buy the mod, whatever cheapest uh, headphone to. Or, yeah. I mean, this it could be off your iPod. It could be off of whatever That's you right. want. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's just it's just gotta make some sound that goes to the subwoofer. That's right. Plug it in and see if anything comes out of that yeah. thing if it moves at all, because um, it should try. Yeah, it, 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 if you if you have it set to the highest crossover frequency or the LFE only, that's right. It should try to make movement, even if it's you know yeah. flute music coming. I'm thinking out of there. somewhere in your house, you, well. you must have something that can play music out of a headphone jack. So that's all you need. I mean, you just need a source, and you just plug it straight into the sub. I mean, you should get to old DVD player, a Blu-ray yeah. player, and use the RCA out. That's right. Go straight in. Yeah. You're fine, fine. And then if it's if the if the subwoofer makes noise, <laughs> first of all, we'll both be shocked. Mm. But if it if it does make noise, then yes, it's the denim and I would call it denim because that should never I mean it's That'd not like weird. you overloaded the outputs <laughs> with a low bass note. I'm it's, pretty it's, sure it's, it's the subs, unfortunately. Yeah. That's not great, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Yeah. So DJ from the Brightside Home Theater podcast. My God, this man's such a hanger on. <laughs> He's our biggest fan. He's our biggest fan. It's like that Cape Fear guy. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, I'm supposed to be on a podcast with him again pretty soon. Oh, I can't remember okay. when. We're supposed to talk about something. Oh, okay. I, I don't think I'm supposed to spoil it. Okay. I remembered what it is. All right. DJ covered some emails and tweets about the inconsistent experience people had while streaming Wonder Woman 84 on HBO Max. I think that it was consistently not very good, <laughs> the movie. I haven't seen it. I don't know. I'm withholding judgment. I don't trust All anybody's right. opinion. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to see it someday. I just, it just won't be on HBO Max. Uh, he had the HD guys go over internet network considerations, and DJ talked about how the streaming device you are using might limit which formats are supported, which is all, all that's true. In fact, I have an article about that mm. on uh, on AV Gadgets about which streaming service is best for, uh, or which box is best for each streaming right. service. You know, spoiler alert, if you're not streaming YouTube, it's, the, like the Apple TV 4K. <laughs> uh, for example, Roku devices don't support Atmos from their HBO Max app yet. I wrote that before HBO Max was supported by anybody, so it's, I don't think they mentioned them. Mm. Uh, but, but what about the settings within your streaming device? Is it possible to have a streaming device that supports the best possible audio and video for quality from HBO Max or any other giving streaming service for that matter and have a rock solid internet network connection but still end up with lower quality simply due to suboptimal settings? Is there a particular streaming device that keeps it simple and basically guarantees that anybody using it will be getting the best <laughs> possible quality? No, there no, sure isn't. No, I don't think there is. I don't think there is. I think everybody's sure got is. settings in there for people to, yeah. to, to, to play with. And like yeah. in the NVIDIA Shield, we just talked about that a couple of weeks ago or last oh, week yeah. or something. That might be I know one of the Apple's most confusing. The Apple TV 4K has got the put it on the lowest setting for reasons, yep, you know, because yep. Dolby Atmos. I mean, I mean Dolby Vision. Yeah, and then we all know how great Microsoft is <laughs> as getting as getting sound out of their boxes. So yeah, no, I don't think there is. Yeah, I, I mean, pretty much all of the streaming devices that they're defaulting to the thing of like out of the box. Most of them let you change this now. At least it doesn't right. have to stay this way. But out of the box, if you uh, say yes, I have Dolby Vision. And someone who bought a TV with the big Dolby Vision logo on it, of course they're going to say, when, the, when it comes right up and it asks you, hey, we detected that your TV supports Dolby Vision. Want to use it? I mean, how many people are going to say no? But when you do, everything comes out in Dolby Vision all the time. That's, that's not correct. Now, is that going to make Wonder Woman 84 on HBO Max look worse than it could? Well, no, because the best that you could get would be the Dolby Vision stream. Um, but, you know, it could definitely make other content 
that you're watching that is supposed to be in standard dynamic range, yeah, the, the colors might be off or the contrast might be off because it's doing a you know a fake Dolby Vision conversion inside the stream box. And pretty much all of them work that way. Um, where you have to at least change it to, yeah, you know, match the the contents uh, dynamic range. The other big one is the frame rate, of course. You know, that that by default, nobody, even the Apple TV 4K, by default, it does not match the original 24 frames per second. A lot of them give you the option of doing so. Some of them you have to manually switch every time between 24 and 60. Uh, but by default, they don't switch. So most people are seeing all of their streaming content at 60 frames per second with Judder because that is the default on all of them. So very few people are actually seeing it in 24p with the smoother Judder-free motion. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's not only possible, it is the case that very few people are seeing the image from any of the streaming services in the very best quality that they possibly could. Uh, and there are settings to change that in most of the streaming boxes now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. These things are just, I swear, they're just too new. <laughs> well, they're also trying to do the thing of they don't want your TV to like do the blank screen when it changes. Right. You know, it changes right. frame rates. There's a blank screen for a second or two that changes right. color spaces or whatever it is. And they don't want it because people are, why, why, is it, why is my TV blinking? Right. You know? <sighs> I know. All right. <laughs> Dwayne. Is Onkyo Pioneer completely out of business? Uh, yeah, I heard about this. They have zero products in stock. Accessories for less doesn't carry them anymore. Their customer service line is closed down. So Dwayne is concerned that the Pioneer Elite receiver he bought less than a year ago won't have any warranty coverage if something happens to go wrong. Do we have any info? I mean, not any more than anybody else does. I mean, right now, there's a lot of supposition that's out there right now. But we have to remember that uh, between COVID shortages of almost everything, uh, manufacturers trying to stay very lean with their ordering and manufacturing of things so that they don't have so much money tied up in stock that's not being moved and the AKM fire not that long ago mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of reasons to think that companies like I, uh, Harmony is the same or Logitech uh, mm -hmm. the discontinuing Harmony is the same thing they're like completely gone everywhere I mean we've talked about how uh, APC's uh, 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 it's power, you know, their their home theater line of surge protectors and uh, battery, battery backups. backups and you and uh, power conditioners are gone. They're mm -hmm. just gone. So does that mean that they're completely gone or not coming back? We don't know. We still don't know. But we have to assume that there's ex a lot of factors out there that are playing into whether or not. Uh, uh, these these brands are are, are just like in the holding pattern, or they're going to come back. I don't have if if you told me today that that USA that that uh, that Onkyo USA or whatever or in Pioneer were to somehow both disappear and merge and become you know Pio Onkyo Ponko, Pio Co or something like that you know a brand new collaborative brand I would not be surprised uh, I I don't see them completely disappearing well uh, I mean there, there there is the bit of info we had back from the summer which was that. Uh, Onkyo USA is gone. Right. That that's done. Right, right. Onkyo USA is gone right. because all Onkyo and Pioneer distribution has now been sold to Klipsch, uh, or actually Klipsch's parent company. Um, so Onkyo is continuing in Asia, but in North America there is no more Onkyo or Pioneer USA division. That that's all being handled by Klipsch's parent company now. Um, so I mean, it might just be that they're within that transition, um, and and that's what's going on right now. Everything else on top of it, all the COVID stuff, all of the shipping right. problems, the parts delays, the AKM fire, all of that stuff on top of it obviously doesn't help. And then there was a corporate restructuring going on with the sale of that division to the parent company of Klipsch on top of it all, which alone might have resulted in what's happening right now of customer service lines being down and the website is pretty darn janky and uh, you know nothing's in stock. So... Um, I mean, given that they sold the thing and that, you know, 
Klipsch put out the press release saying, yes, they're going to be the distributor for those products. Now, given that Pioneer is a big car audio company, and I don't see that disappearing completely, right. you know, um, some part of this is going to continue to live on. I suppose the question, the bigger question is, are we going to see new Onkyo and Pioneer receiver models? No idea on that. Um, yeah, we have no idea. I, I wouldn't be shocked if they've got to do something. They've got to do something. So Pioneer, Pioneer was kind of hanging their hat on their Class D amplification. Yeah. Uh, and Onkyo was had for years been sort of a uh, a feature leader, and they just sort of fell off from yeah. that when they started running into problems. Well, it was when they got bought by Gibson that everything just yeah. fell apart after that. And they they tried yeah. they tried to sell to Sound United, and then they backed out of that deal because the financials weren't right. And uh, yeah. yeah, so things are not looking great over there. Will you have warranty coverage? Well, Onkyo and Pioneer are still owned by that. Same parent company that owns Klipsch now. That still exists. That warranty coverage is not supposed to go away. But I don't actually know who to tell you to contact right now. Because no, I don't either. Onkyo's own or Pioneer's own customer service lines. Yeah, they're 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 down. So I guess I guess you call Klipsch. <laughs> like they're they're definitely still around. I I don't know what else to say. Yeah, it is it is a bit murky, Dwayne. Uh, but it's murky for us too, and we don't know what the what the outcome of the situation is going to be. Apparently, don't don't watch uh, 4K Flash Gordon <laughs> would be my suggestion because you can't afford the repairs, right. dude. All right, Bob in the Philippines. Bob decided to replace his ho- the horn in his car. Dude, I guess it's audio, but that's just, that's just a stretch. Well, it goes to a more I know, broader topic. I know, I know. <laughs> he put in the 110 dB unit that requires power directly from the car battery. He used a relay and the correct inline fuse, but it still wasn't as loud as he wanted, so he put in the second identical horn. This is a man with some He wants some, some people road to rage get out issues. the way. <laughs> the, you know, if you've ever been, I haven't been to the Philippines, but I've been to pe- the countries that have very similar looking roads <laughs> right. as the Philippines as far as driving and stuff like that. And yeah, this Bob... Bob's Bob's not about that scooter life, Apparently and those scooter not. people need to get out the way. Seems yeah, like he's uh, he's uh, he's he's a, he's not he's he's not he's got a couple of horns. He's not afraid to use it. So, anyways, so two horns rated at 100 d, 110 dB each working together, they do indeed sound louder. But is there an equation to figure out exactly how much louder? How does that actually work anyway? Why two two horns both producing 110 end up being louder than the 110 dB when combined if the sound waves are basically independent and just pass right through each other? Well, they don't. They sometimes add to each other and they sometimes subtract. From, uh, well, I mean, they each do other. We- pass through each other, but where they intersect uh, right, in those right. points where they intersect, uh, then the if the waves are both going up at the same time, they they go up even more as as they. It should be what one hundred and thirteen, right? He should be getting about one hundred and thirteen out of uh, these things now. Minimum, yeah. You might if, guess? if the horns are right next to each other or right on top of each other, it then could be one hundred sixteen. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah. So it's just like subwoofers, you know, That's subwoofers right. in the room. You you're, you're you're co-locating them. <laughs> Uh, so those 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 I had the envision that they had him on both sides of his big. Uh, I mean, it could be uh, one's going out the front, one's hog. going out the back, or something. I don't know. <laughs> Bo- his big boss hog, like you know, white Cadillac with the <laughs> steer horns in the front right, right, from right. the from the. Uh, uh, What's the name of that show? The Dukes of Hazard. Yeah. So he's got two horns, one on each, right behind them, each of the lights. That's what. That's why I envisioned it. So as the the waves intersect with each other, the point where they intersect, they're boosting each other yeah. for the most part, and that and that's why you get that three dB, or if they're right on top of each other, six dB boost. Uh, so the same 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 thing that we would say in, in a home theater. Yeah, and and just purely conceptually, it's it's just about displacement of air. So if you have yeah. two things displacing the air simultaneously, uh, then you are going to displace more air. And that's that's all that is conceptually. So Joseph, Joseph says we've often recommended the NHT Super Zeros. What about the larger NHT Super One model? They happen to be on sale at Amazon Canada, and Joseph is thinking about getting a, a pair to use as his main uh, left and right speakers. But he already has Paradigm Titan Two speakers. Would we expect? The NHT Super Ones to be an upgrade. He's sitting ten feet away from them in a thirteen by five. Uh, 15 foot room 13 10 feet away you need to sit closer uh <laughs> what? i don't know what these... why <laughs> i don't know uh i i didn't i review the super ones i feel like i reviewed i reviewed the super ones of the super i don't remember which one i, I don't reviewed. recall 
I mean, they're they're um, essentially the Super Zero just with a six and a half inch driver instead of a four inch driver. So, yeah. Know. So I mean, these are very similar to the Paradigm as far as size, right? Wise, right? They're, yeah. they're a tweeter with a six and a half inch uh, That's mid base right. driver in there. I would be, I, I mean, there's in Paradigm is not exactly going for a colored sound, not any nope. more than NHT is. I would be shocked if you noticed a difference at all, <laughs> much less a <laughs> significant sounding di- difference increase you know quality increase i would be surprised to be honest with you yes if you if you um, were asking say hey these are a great deal and uh, i want to add them as my surrounds to my paradigm that's titans literally where i thought that was you going, know to be honest with any you. Yeah. issue with that i'd be like no issue at all uh no, but no. to replace your paradigm titans with nht super ones i'm like i'm not gonna call that an upgrade that's a lateral move in my opinion, yeah. um, I mean, I got no problem with you using NHD Super ones. That certainly not that. But I just, if the idea is to upgrade your Paradigm Titans, I'm like, nah, that, no. <laughs> Even if they're a really good deal, it's like, nah, it's not an upgrade. It's not bad. Yeah. It's just, it's not an upgrade. Yeah, I don't. I, I, I lateral move would be the way I would yep. describe it. It, it, it will look different, mm-hmm. and you might feel differently about them. But I doubt that they are substantively substantively different yeah i mean maybe he was really concerned about sealed versus ported because that would be going on the super ones are sealed the paradigm yeah. titans are ported but no i bet you couldn't pick him out of the <laughs> yeah. dark room <laughs> but you couldn't tell which one was which right. in the dark room uh infinite gary gary asked do we think oled is going to be around long term or do we expect that something like micro led is going to replace it more or less the way oleds replace plasmas i think everything's going to be replaced eventually mm. gary even you believe it or not <laughs> there's going to be another infinite gary in my life as i'm doing this podcast three years from now and you've gone on to the great audio uh listening room in the sky i don't know how old gary is he's probably younger than me but uh i will uh we will have another Gary, who uh, we will not call him Infinite because we will retire the name with you. But in my heart of hearts, I'll know he's your spiritual uh, you know, successor. Uh, his name is actually DJ because he asks just as many questions as you do. But uh, yeah, uh, no. Do I think OLEDs are going to go away before LCDs? Is that the real, the real question? Or do we think LCDs will be replaced? <laughs> it's about price, Gary. Yeah. The reasons why OLEDs, uh, why why plasmas went away is because they couldn't bring down the price enough to compete with LCDs, and they just weren't selling. So then they came out with OLEDs, which gave you, uh, you know, the, the larger sizes and the the, the the same black levels and everything else. But they, you know, they've they've started bringing those down in price pretty significantly now. Are they touching LCDs yet? They are not, but they are getting there. So will OLEDs? be replaced before lcds get replaced (laughs) uh it's a good question i don't know the answer my heart of hearts i'm gonna say that yeah that's probably what's gonna happen what's gonna happen was we're finally gonna end up with micro leds uh that are going to be you know cheaper to produce than le than uh oleds uh and we'll end up with uh with self-emissive LED lights that are either like the QNEDs, not the the one that <laughs> the LG's LG trying to call QNED, but the actual, the actual <laughs> yeah, QNEDs. You know, they'll find a way to make a self emissive uh, technology right. that'll be compatible price wise with LCDs, and then LCDs will also go away. But then again, so will all LEDs. <laughs> so I think they, they'll all honestly, go away. Uh, uh, I, j- just looking at all the trends, the thing that they have been trying to get to for years is some type of self-emissive display that can be inkjet printed. That is what they have been yeah. aiming for for uh, over a decade now. And like OLED, they've got some prototypes where they could inkjet print OLEDs, but it just hasn't been made commercially viable yet. There's theoretically a way to do it with micro LED, but it's, that, that's really, really difficult. It's still a pick and place procedure, which is why micro LED displays are so incredibly expensive still. Um, the one that is the most promising, and this is still years away, but the one that is the most promising is a full quantum dot display, not a quantum dot that has a backlight. We're talking about the quantum dots where there are blue and red and green quantum dots that are excited directly by an electron beam. 
uh, because those can definitely be inkjet printed and all you need is the electrical backplane. The problem is developing the blue quantum dots that are excited directly by free electrons instead of a blue light source. Um, because anything else, any of these other technologies, including the quantum nanorods, uh, getting those inkjet printed is a challenge because you have to have these individual little blue lights that are in behind there. And the, the inkjet printing is what's going to allow them to create a display that can be produced exceedingly quickly and cheaply uh, and with very, very high consistency. So quantum dots are it. It's just a matter of getting that electron backplane and the blue quantum dots that don't need a, a blue light behind them. Uh, once we get there, OLED will definitely get replaced. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, we'll see. I, I don't know that. Well, I don't know. We'll see. Okay. I, I don't want to keep going. Yeah, on it's this all thing. I'd rather answer another yeah. question. Julian. Julian says he greatly appreciates our discussion about things he's read in UK hi fi publications over the years. He agrees that a lot of the standard advice that's been repeated for decades is actually poor and misleading. It wasn't at the time, but it is. <laughs> now that people have said that for 20 straight years. So he's on board with our suggestions and feeling confident that his Yamaha RX A370 can handle playing stereo music in addition to full surround <laughs> can sound. Can it ever? Good. I didn't know in his previous yeah. question that that's the AV receiver it had. That's a really good receiver, man. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a nice one. For his choice of dual subwoofers, he appreciated the BK Electronics suggestions, but the smaller full footprint of either SVS SB2000 Pro or the PC2000 Pro cylinders will work better in the setup, and he doesn't mind the price of either. The room will roughly be 10 by 15. Oh my God, he's going to crush that room. <laughs> and, and an enclosed rectangle. Their kitchen is directly below this room, and they do have attached neighbors. The back wall will be shared, the shared wall with the neighbors. Do you like your neighbors? Do they like you? Do you want them to continue to like you? These are the questions we'll be asking so given his room size the proposed placement and the consideration about neighbors should he get the sp2000 pros or the pc2000 pros front firing versus down firing sealed versus ported do those things matter in terms of sound transmission to downstairs and the neighbors i wrote the article about this on navy gadgets too <laughs> ported versus sealed right, right, subs right. <laughs> so so yes um it does not matter uh in fact front firing down firing up firing backwards firing doesn't matter, doesn't matter either uh, the the base waves are are so long that they are reflecting around the room f many times before you actually hear yeah. them, and they're so it doesn't matter where where orientation the driver is in. Okay, the things that you'll want to do to keep your neighbors sane or keep your neighbors liking you, uh, you want to decouple your sub from the floor. If you get the PC two thousand Pro, it will already come with a sub the the sound path That's isolation right. feats. So feats, I said feats. I said feats, uh, like F E A T S, because ah, it's a feat <laughs> to decouple these things. That's why um, the, the sound path isolation feat will be included if you decide to go with uh, the SB two thousand Pro, which would still be fine in this room because mm. it's ten by fifteen by nothing. Uh, you would have to buy them separately, or you would could get one. Of, and I wrote an article about this about decoupling <laughs> your subwoofer as well. Uh, there's a couple of options there that you can look at the the the, the platforms that are out there. There, I actually found these weird feet. They're like li little square, like four four inch by four inch by like one or two inch thick uh, rectangles of like f foam, mm -hmm. but it's stiff foam. But it's it you can put like washing machines right, yeah. on it, and it'll stop the vibrations from going through the floor. And they're cheap. They're ugly, <laughs> but they're cheap. But so if they're hidden you know, underneath the, sound the sound isolation, you're not gonna look at them very much. <laughs> You're not going to be looking at them too much, so maybe it'll be okay. So you've got some uh, uh, options there. Um, but you're still sharing a wall with these people, mm -hmm. and uh, y y there's not there's only so much you can do. So you'll want to, uh, if there's not already lots of uh, uh, sound, noise, uh, um, isolation going on in your room already, uh, you could try if there's any outlets on that back wall. You could try mm. filling them with uh, with foam, with uh, acoustic, not well, acoustic putty. foam, but like the spray, the putty, putty stuff, yeah. right? So that that stops that flanking path. Mm -hmm. uh, any if your if your roofs, if your ceilings are shared, you want to make sure mm. that you seal up anything that's going that direction. Mm. In fact, seal it all up. Uh, the re the reality though is that there's only so much you're going to be able to do. 
uh, for those people. Uh, I really feel like the, so th he likes the SB2000. Could he go away with the SB1000 in this room? I kind of feel like uh, it's it's pretty close there. I mean, SB1000 doesn't get you all the way down to 20 hertz, so. I don't think that you want to go all the way down to 20 the hertz. Problem. The right I mean, there, but yeah. what I will say between the SB2000 Pro and the PC2000 Pro, in addition to coming with the isolation feet on the cylinders, uh, you also have the option of sealing them. It is the world's biggest port plug ever, because that is a right. huge diameter port on the PC2000 Pro, but they do have a port plug available. You have to request it, uh, but it doesn't cost any extra when you do. But you can just say, hey, uh, I might like to run these sealed, and they go, oh, okay, we'll, we'll just include the gigantic circular piece of foam that blocks up our enormous port on the PC2000 Pro, but it gives you the option. You can run it ported or sealed. Uh, so if that was any concern whatsoever, you have that option. Um, gosh. I mean, I, I'm just a fan of going with the cylinders because I think they're easier to position. They come with the feet. I do too. You can go ported know, or sealed. Uh, uh, if you're okay with the price he's, and the size, I'd do those. He's got the location of these subs in his room. You it know, looks good. Well mapped out. It it's, looks good. Uh, it looks like I'm just gonna just ballpark here. It looks like the 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 there's one on the on the right wall about maybe six feet in from the back wall. Sure. So it's on the right wall about six feet in from the back wall, and there's one on the on the left wall about six feet in from the front That's wall. That's right. Can't can't do better than that. That's great. So yeah, I like the way this this this. And you're gonna this, be walking by them looks. to get past the side of the couch to get to the desk at the back. Cylinders you can brush right by. You can bump right yeah, into it's them. No problem. No problem. Yeah, I love them. Oh my god, I will never go back to it if I can I help, help it. A, 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 the the cylinder subs are just so much. And 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 and, and you want to like get behind it to do something. You just grab the top of it and you just tip it over. That's right. No problem. It just tips. <laughs> It's not, it's not you're not wrangling this hundred pound behemoth with sharp edges everywhere. Even if they're not sharp, still sucks. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, blah, 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 blah. so given his room size, the proposed placement, and the consideration about neighbors, should he get the? Oh, I already said this, right? Yep, okay, we did yeah. that part. We're on to B. Uh, he currently owns five Q acoustic speakers, Concept Forty Towers, Concept Twenty Bookshelf speakers, and the matching Concept Center. Q acoustics has new Concept Three Hundred Bookshelf model that's supposed to be an upgrade. And one of Julian's main concerns is two channel listening. So, do we think it would be worthwhile to get the new? Concept 300 speakers as its main left and right. The Concept 40 towers are quite slim and compact, so they'd actually be convenient to use as surrounds. And the Concept 20s could become surround backs. Another notion he has in mind is to try some Kef LS50 speakers, perhaps even seven identical LS50s all around. Man's going to spend some money. He's going to spend some money. So what do we think is going to be the most worthwhile for both critical two-channel listening and surround sound for movies? Well, if you haven't gone into a store, uh, and I can understand if you haven't during COVID and all that, but if you haven't gone to the store and actually listened to these speakers, any of the ones mm. that you're talking about, I know that you've already heard con the, the concept ones before, but the... Um, the uh, if you haven't already gone and, and listened to them, you should. Yeah, I uh, well, but those concept three hundreds. I I question whether they're genuinely a sonic upgrade over the speakers you already have, simply because all they talk about in their marketing and it, that is so. Oh man, is that some BS marketing? I was a, I'm a pretty big fan of Q Acoustics. I think their sound quality and design is solid, and their prices are very reasonable, but. Wow, did they dip into some BS marketing for those new speakers. Uh, but pretty much all they talk about are the new stands, uh, which at mm. least they they did go, because I was worried. These are like tripod stands, which frankly, I think look very strange and take up way too much floor space. Um, but regardless, I was worried that it was going to be all about how it like solidly connects your speakers to the ground. No, thankfully, uh, the tops of them actually have springs on them <laughs> to isolate the speakers from the stand. So at least they did that part of it right. But like, that's all they talked about. The, the, the rest of it, it's the, it's the same drivers as what you already have. So I don't really know. Can I tell you? Can I can I tell you a little secret about this Concept Forty speakers uh, that you're looking at right here? I think they're just really big bookshelf speakers on yep. stands. That's Q Acoustics. If you <laughs> if you look at the back of the speaker and where the dry where the, <laughs> the uh, port where the port placement is, you see how high that is. Yeah. <laughs> there ain't nothing below that port, Haas. Yeah. They, it, it's it's just empty space. No, and those are the ones um, he already has. But like I. Right. Um, so, uh, so you're going from a bookshelf speaker with a stand to a smaller bookshelf speaker without a stand for like. Well, it's a, over it's actually twice a bit. The, the concept three hundreds are are closer to the concept uh, fifty towers, so they're like a bigger. Okay. They're bigger, but I 
honestly, dude, I uh, hate those stands. Maybe he loves them. Maybe he loved the looks of those Concept 300 stands, but I, I hate... I mean, that is a ridiculous footprint that they have because it's a big tripod. I can't Very see Very weird. Oh, the, oh, there it is. I saw it. Yeah. I found it. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. I'm going to trip over that. Yeah, this is not a big room. I, that, that's, I don't know. Uh, but regardless, if... If you want to get two more Q acoustic speakers to expand to a seven speaker setup, I got no beef with that. Um, right. I would, I would not first. instantly buy seven Kef LS50 speakers. First of all, I no, think that's okay. overkill. I would be very happy to use, like if I had three LS50s across my front uh, and then my surrounds and surround backs were Kef, um, you know, Q series speakers, I'd be more than happy with that. And that would save a lot of money. So. Uh, consider that, but definitely audition them. They're well worth an audition. You absolutely might love the Kef LS50s because many, many people do, including me. And I think those would be an upgrade over your Q Concept Series speakers. Uh, so that could right. be worth it, but I wouldn't go buying seven of them and definitely not sight on herd. Um, yeah, that's about it. Right. I don't know, like Q Acoustics, what, you know, what kind of sonic character they're going for, but you definitely could... You know, if you go and you hear the LS fifties and you like them, right. you could put three of them up front yes. and then use the rest of your speakers to do other things, yeah. like you were talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I am. I mean, I like I said, I haven't heard them, so I'm not going to pass any judgment right. on them whatsoever. Those speaker stands are beautiful and you know contemporary and they're contemporary. I'll non- give them that <laughs> non functional. Non-functional is what they are. <laughs> They're like the easel they, stand that Samsung had for their enormous televisions. I'm like that. It is so impractical. <laughs> it's like the the uh, uh, the Bang and Olufsen TV that would turn itself into portrait mode. The the one time you wanted to That's watch right. something from your phone onto it. All right, Rob. Who do we have left? We have David B and Mark. H, I believe that's it. Yes, that's it. David B and Mark H, and uh, yes, definitely had questions that came in on Monday and Tuesday, and so those shall be going on the topic list for next week. All right. I want to thank our 126 patrons over at patreon.com, including James W. And uh, we want to thank uh, Chris, David, and Victor for sending me photos to use on AV Gadgets, David for talking us up to audio, Corey for talking us up to accessories for less, and the notes of gratitude for Mike, Lee, Nathan, Joseph, and David. Wow, you just went through all the names there. Uh, I yes, uh, I will mention anyone who wants to make a one-time donation, you can do so via PayPal. Come to avrant.com, and the link for PayPal is on the website. Patreon.com slash avrantpodcast is where you can sign up for an ongoing automatic monthly donation a voluntary subscription if you please 126 patrons over there and james w is one of them thank you all very much for the financial support chris david and victor thanks for sending in those photos and giving tom permission to use them david thanks for talking us up to outlaw audio Corey, thanks for talking us up to accessories for less and mike lee nathan joseph and david really do appreciate the notes of gratitude and encouragement and thank you to everybody for continuing to listen and sending in your questions if you want to get your question answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now stay in and listen to something. Once your question answered, send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.